Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, conference. My name is Matthew Landrio. So uh, welcome, welcome. Thank you for, for being here uh, this morning, your Eastern time. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we started our conference yesterday talking about political consequences, political impact mm -hmm. of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Today, we're going to transition to military consequences for this panel. Then economic and social consequences for the second panel. Um, so just to, uh, again, uh, name a bit the, the partners that, that made all of this possible, I want to thank uh, for the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network, Natson, for, for their support. Hosted, of course, this conference by the Center for International Policy Studies and the Observatory on Politics and Security in the Arctic, which I, I direct. Uh, Great support from Minister of National uh, Ministry of National Defense, Canada, Mines Program, and the Ministère de Relations Internationales et de la Francophonie of the Government of Quebec. So, uh, we talked a bit about the rationale for this conference yesterday, talking about the kind of post February 24 world. I think we talked about a lot about the Arctic Council yesterday. Today will be a, a lot about military consequences, NORAD, NATO, the kind of um, potential consequences for Western states of, of uh, Russia's uh, um, new aggressive aggressive stance, aggressive posture. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll pass the baton to, to Jackie Kidd of the Inuit Patriot Canada. Jackie. Great, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, good morning. My panelists, um, but, and also to the participants. I'd like to first extend my gratitude to the organizers of this event as well. Um, I'm a senior advisor at Inuit Career Tanatami, or ITK. I co-lead with the Department of National Defense on the new Inuit Crown Partnership Committee Priority Area Sovereignty Defense and Security. I'd just like to start off by saying that Inuit across Inuit Nunagata are increasingly aware of the changing landscape and the growing number of access points to their waters. With more research and exploratory vessels uh, entering each year, a growing concern encircles not only security, but also the effects on the environment, the flora, the fauna, and the people. So today I'm joined by panelists whose expertise will guide us through conversations on possible emerging threats and delve into the new geopolitical space that the invasion of Ukraine has created for the Arctic. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the panelists who have graciously suggested a name and title only introduction to allow uh, more time for conversation as we move through this panel. So today we have with us Dr. Andrea Sharon, Director of the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba, Captain Jake French, Deputy Commander and Chief of Staff at Joint Task Force North, Dr. Thomas Hughes, Post postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International and Defense Policy and forthcoming 22-23 postdoctoral fellow for the Canadian Defense Security Network, and Dr. Rebecca Pincus, Assistant Professor in the Strategic and Operational Research Department in the Center for Naval Warfare Studies at the U.S. Naval uh, War College. So we will jump right into opening remarks. As yesterday, if there are any questions that arise, please throw them in the chat. I will keep uh, note of them, and uh, we will take them up towards the end of the introduction. So I will turn it over to Andrea for your introductory remarks. Thanks very much, and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's always a privilege and an honor. Uh, I'm here in Winnipeg, which is Treaty 1 territory and home of the Métis Nation. Um, and importantly for me as well, it is also the Canadian NORAD Regional Headquarters. And so I want to talk about three consequences or issues um, related to Russia's aggression against Ukraine and, and how they can impact uh, the Arctic. So the first is questions about especially Canadian defense posture. Uh, next are domains of concern. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about maintaining the rule, rules-based international order that we want to continue to have in the Arctic to keep it a functional region. Uh, so first to the questions about Canadian defense, it's amazing to me um, how quickly uh, attention pivoted to how Canada could uh, defend itself against the kind of attack that Ukraine is, is expecting. Now, we have to put this into perspective, especially in an Arctic context. Uh, 
during um, uh, the attack on Ukraine, there was a NATO exercise called Cold Response. It's one of the largest maritime, mostly maritime Arctic exercises. And we didn't see the sort of Russian provocative behavior that we had seen two years previously in another NATO ex exercise called Trident Juncture. All of the Arctic states, including Russia, have uh, reiterated that they think it's really important that the Arctic remain conflict free, that there is very uh, little chance of a conflict being about the Arctic or in the Arctic. But we know that the rhetoric, especially in the Canadian press, can change. And I know yesterday that President Biden did link that continued climate change could have consequences in the Arctic. Nevertheless, I think it's important to understand that the expectation right now is that it isn't because of the Arctic or in the Arctic that we're expecting a conflict. But let's turn to the domains, and I want to talk about three. I want to talk about the cyber domain, the aerospace domain, and the maritime domain. We know that Russia is a particularly adept at attacking us on a daily basis with cyber attacks. Um, this is not as a result of uh, the Russian attack of Ukraine. This has been longstanding and it's something that the Canadian government and Canadian agencies are working to solve. Uh, but we have to remember that all of us have um, an obligation for our due diligence. That's why things like passwords and uh, dual authentication as, as um, sometimes frustrating as they are, are vital to defending uh, Canada and North America. The next one is the aerospace domain. And this is where Whitney Lockenbauer often talks about the through avenue of approach. Since the Cold War, it has been the sort of number one projected avenue of approach. Would there be an attack by Russia on North America? Because now technology allows Russia to potentially be able to launch missiles uh, from Russian space um, into North America, it means that we have to rethink um, how we posture ourselves to guard against that. And so this is turning to a focus on what we call deterrence by detection and by denial. Through the Cold War, we would often talk about deterrence by punishment. That is, the threat of a nuclear exchange was enough to prevent any sort of um, activity. It was never a reasonable option. It is still not a reasonable option. Hence, you may hear in the news uh, attention to things like upgrading of the North Warning System, um, the research and development going into sensors in all domains, so space to subsea, uh, and we'll continue to track uh, that kind of activity. But the last one I want to talk about is the maritime domain, because we often think about the Arctic as exclusively in a maritime domain. And related to the NORAD mission, which was added in 2006 maritime warning, this created a forcing function in Canada to get all the maritime actors, so Transport Canada, Coast Guard, the Royal Na Canadian Navy, uh, Fisheries and Oceans, Ice Services Canada, uh, Canadian Border Services Agency, to all get together and share information using a common lexicon. The Arctic shipping season is just about to launch and through the Marine Security Operations Center based in Halifax, they get together on a daily basis and talk about what they're seeing in an Arctic domain. And this has been, um, I think, the model for other domains of how we need a whole of government approach because most of the activities that happen in the Arctic are not under the purview of the Royal Canadian Navy. In fact, it is in a, a support capacity, but it's things like enforcing Canadian laws, making sure that vessel are safe, that the um, we have appropriate ice navigators, that they understand the really difficult conditions. And so this sharing of information means that everybody's on the same page, and we get to do things like share air surveillance time, um, which is all for the good. 
Um, I just want to finish up then with the rules-based international order. Uh, again, all of the Arctic states, including Russia, have recognized that the rules-based international order of the Arctic needs to continue. Um, certainly, the Russia's Arctic ambassador and chair of the Arctic Council, Nikolai Khrushchev, has mentioned um, he wants to recommence some of the fora that have been put on hold, things like the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable. Um, I'm sure you talked about that yesterday. There is no appetite for any of these high-level meetings to start again. However, I think we do need to think about uh, the Arctic as a possible on-ramp to normalize relations in the future because the Arctic is so important to Russia. After all, it represents nearly 50% of the real estate in the Arctic Ocean. And that's where going back to first principles and ground-based relationships like scientist to scientist and indigenous peoples to indigenous peoples is going to be so important. Those personal relationships are going to be key to helping us normalize relations. It does no good if we freeze out Russia forever. We need them back as part of a um, uh, contributing uh, professional member of the international community. That can't happen for quite some time, but it's good for us to start thinking about that now. And I'll end it there. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. And lots there for us to chew on, and I'm sure supplementary questions coming in. Uh, I would like to pass it over now to Captain Jake French for his opening remarks. Okay, well, good morning, all, and uh, uh, pleased to be with this panel. I'm a Deputy Commander, Joint Task Force North. I've been in this role for uh, two years. Uh, the sun has been up for some time here, so it doesn't feel too early for me, but it's great to be part of this uh, this virtual panel. Um, and um, I think it's a, a, an opportune time, obviously, to discuss um, military consequences and, and just dis discuss where we're at uh, since uh, February 24th. I think um, uh, for the initial remarks, I just wanted to sort of uh, focus on three questions or three main points to ponder. And the first being, what has essentially changed uh, since the recent invasion in the Ukraine? So what are we seeing in the Arctic region uh, that has essentially changed? And secondly, what are some of the military consequences of that change that we've noticed uh, in the short term and, and in the, perhaps in the long term? Or what we, can, we, can we foresee? And then thirdly, what does that really mean for Canada? Or what does that mean for Canadian defense, Canadian security? What's Canada's next move? Uh, based on those things. So uh, to get back to the first main point, so does the recent invasion of the Ukraine, uh, international response, change the nature of the security dialogue amongst the members of the Arctic nations? Um, and, you know, I think in 2014, we saw uh, some initial steps uh, there in terms of what was going to be a, a lack of security dialogue, dialogue with Russia. Um, however, in, in, in the meantime, the Arctic Council still somewhat functional, minus the security di dialogue. Uh, and the main debate was to be whether or not there'd be, uh, at that time, a mechanism for security dialogue with Russia in view of Crimea. Um, no Arctic chads, a meeting, but at, at the time we have, um, you know, an Arctic Security Forces roundtable at the two-star level that's uh, discussing security minus Russia. Uh, since the Ukraine invasion, I think, and having the Arctic Council put on pause, uh, by members other than Russia and, not, and while Russia is chair. I think there's a unanimous consensus now on condemning the actions uh, and standing in solidarity with, with the Ukraine, which is making that difficult. Um, I think based on that, uh, security dialogue amongst Arctic 7, um, which, uh, you know, minus Russia is likely to grow. I think why? I think that's probably reinforcing a message of solidarity amongst, amongst the like-minded nations. Uh, and signaling this strategically. So much as the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable has done minus Russia since 2014, uh, I think this might the security dialogue might be elevated, elevated amongst uh, Arctic nations. Um, and I think we know the why. I think though the consequences of that uh, are probably gonna be yet to be determined. Um, secondly, I think what have we seen as, as a change? I think we're seeing, uh, as Andrea mentioned, you know, uh, our attention to an exercise like cold response um, that had been planned and, and what that meant then in terms of uh, what the military was doing. I think military exercises are going to do the focus on the deterrent uh, and the defensive effect 
of these large scale military exercises and the frequency of scale is, is probably going to increase. And I think we've seen this shift in the mindset, not necessarily in what Russia is doing in the North, but the shift in the mindset of why we're using the exercise and operations as we do, or even the use of an ORAD exercise uh, to show what, show what we're doing in the region. Uh, for Canada in particular, I think Minister Anand's comments in mid-May uh, about gathering the, the Arctic ministers of defense for security dialogue uh, is pretty pertinent. I think also the minister's commitment to uh, accelerating the NORAD modernization file and to be announced to accelerate is, is pretty telling as well. Um, and I think Canada is looking to reinforce Arctic sovereignty through diplomacy uh, at this time. And I think that that dialogue is going to continue to build. And I think it's from the, from the level it was at prior to Ukraine, I think it's been elevated to a new level post uh, Ukraine. Uh, is this really about a, a new threat axis that needs to be addressed? Is it about the, this, the, now we're concerned about what could be coming from this axis based on what we're seeing of the actions of Ukraine? I don't really think so. Or is it just a need for a security dialogue amongst allies to be elevated and seen, uh, shown to a potential adversary, and perhaps a dialogue to, to address common Arctic concerns and risks? I think that's probably more the reason. Um, and I think it gets more interesting as Sweden and Finland uh, apply to NATO uh, and enter stage right, uh, as we see that affecting obviously the Arctic uh, security dialogue, uh, not just the uh, NATO membership, but also uh, Russia's calculus as to how to reinitiate Arctic dialogue at large uh, with other Arctic, Arctic nations. So, you know, what has really changed in the region? Not really much, um, but I think the need for an immediate uh, the immediate need for security dialogue in the short term um, may outweigh some of the need for full participation from each Arctic state uh, for all sorts of other reasons in the long term. And that, I think that puts strain on the regional cooperation framework, um, but that strain I think is recognized and, and it's probably being weighed against uh, the risk of not doing anything such as what we're doing right now. Um, second question was, what are some of the short term, uh, long term military consequences of this change? If we see this as a change post Ukraine, and, and very much what's uncertain, uh, what, what are some of the consequences? Um, I'd agree with most analysts that most, from most vantage points right now, it's really too early to tell. We don't really know what all the real impacts are. People way smarter than myself are saying it's too early to tell, so I'm not gonna jump in and say, I, I, I know what's gonna happen. But I think that um, the Ukraine crisis is not over, it's ongoing, and I don't think any hard conclusions can be made about what the dynamic or what the consequences could be when the dynamic is still changing in the geostrategic sense. Um, I know that, you know, as, as Andrea mentioned, there's not a lot of posturing, Russian posturing in the Arctic region right now, nor is there a lot of close call kinetic moves or, or something that we need to be ex exactly concerned about. So our posturing in the region in the West isn't necessarily a response to new Russian actions uh, in, that, in that area. And, and um, that's for obvious reasons in terms of where Russia is focused right now on the Ukraine front. Uh, and that's drawn a lot of Russian resources towards that area. So there hasn't been the same level of tension for Russia in the Arctic um, as, as probably would be without the Ukraine there. Uh, that said, what's, what's likely to occur? I think some of the short term and the military consequences in the short term, I think we're going to see increased frequency, as I mentioned, of the dialogue uh, of Arctic allies and partners. Uh, I think that's going to jump into a new domain here with Sweden and Finland if they join into that forum. Um, presence operations, uh, I think, are going to take on new meaning, and the strategic communications that associate with those operations are going to increase in scale, uh, perhaps frequency as well, but I know that they're probably going to increase in scale, and, and that is to demonstrate the interoperability uh, of the allied nations in a northern environment and to act as a deterrent. I think the strategic communication is also going to try to get ahead of information operations, um, uh, get ahead of cyber uh, and deal with some of the gray zone activities uh, that we see as necessary to, uh, to, to combat against. And then, you know, revive discussions in the short term on the infrastructure and logistical basing networks that will serve our common purposes in order to, to support the operational networks. And I think that discussion about how we actually are going to sustain Northern operations is becoming more and more at play um, once we realize what the, um, the, the, what's necessary in order to operate further and further north. And it isn't just about putting presence up there, but it's also about logistical basing uh, and the political alliances that make that happen. And so I think that's already increasing in frequency. Um, you know, I, it, as uh, one of the panelists, Thomas has, has pointed out, this is not a matter of simply counting equipment. I think in terms of what our Canadian reaction is, um, the inventory comparisons um, 
putting it into raw numbers is, is really oversimplifying uh, what we need to do uh, in this space. I think it's a more complicated space uh, than that. I think particularly compelling in uh, Thomas's argument, though, is Canada cannot simply participate in the multilateral forum of alliances and partnerships that are so critical to remaining important for Canada, but also Canada must also be proactive in this stance and demonstrate its own ability to deter or respond to acts of aggression uh, if we're going to be an effective participant in the Arctic politics. And I think probably all Arctic nations are thinking uh, somewhat the same in that regard, because it's difficult to base, it's difficult to move money into that region, it's difficult to stage there. Uh, but how do we play our own part in that role uh, while building the alliance that, that keeps us collectively secure? So I think we all agree this is a balancing act of uh, enforcing Canadian Arctic sovereignty that always has been. It hasn't really changed that much since, since the Ukraine crisis. Um, but it's just uh, to say that it's not completely passive for Canada. It's not just, just participating in a forum. We expect our uh, allies to do some of the heavy lifting. We expect ourselves to do some of the heavy lifting. And I think our participation in the Northern theaters uh, to assist our allies is also going to be important. So if someone's to ask where we're going to focus our efforts domestically or internationally, I think the answer has been and will remain that we'll do both. Um, you know, in many ways, I think Canadian military operation presence for post post uh, conflict in Ukraine and, and pre is going to be much the same. Um, what we've been doing for the last 20 years, it's still just as challenging to try to project what we have in a, in, in, in a limited sense to the north and keep it there and sustain it there and have that type of operation. We've been practicing that more and more in the last two decades. I think we're gonna to continue to practice it more. We're probably just going to probably message why we're doing it and, and uh, when we're doing it probably a little bit tighter. Um, on the long-term consequences, I think, uh, although uncertain, I think something that would be very interesting to watch is, you know, will the Russians counteract or react to an increased re-energized presence in their adjacent regions and at their doorstep Post Ukraine, and and likely I think once the Ukraine front does you know um, does draw down, how much into what scale they might react in the air in the maritime domains, um, and I think they have clearly laid out Arctic strategy uh, to 2035. And the question will will they have the means or political will to enact the strategy, create their area of influence uh, once there's that drawdown? I think that that could be an interesting thing to watch. Um, I think as Dr. Pincus pointed out in some some of the work that you know can further NATO involvement or defense of the Arctic dilute the role of the Arctic states uh, is an interesting question. Uh, can greater NATO involvement in the region lead to further escalation, perhaps a heightened security dilemma? Um, I think probably those are a lot of the questions we were asking in the previous two years. The question now is, has it already occurred? But I think it would be interesting to see that um, what NATO's uh, presence at their doorstep will do, uh, as, as Andrea mentioned, it's, it's not extremely apparent to us now, but it could be later at a later stage once the resources are there uh, and once they decide to maybe react a little bit uh question is going to be how much and to what scale but i think the other question the part of that is, is is can we do the reverse can we can we not uh, be more present in the north given uh given the consequences and i think that to, in order for us to be uh really measuring what is effective deterrence uh, i think that's the reason why we're doing what we're doing we just have to be very aware of what russia's reactions to those things might be um you know, in, in long term, too, I think a lot of other folks have perhaps um, 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 touched on, you know, what what could happen with, between China and Russia. I think in the long term, that's a that's a question that's that's going to play out. How does that play out in the Arctic region? Is that an alliance? I think what we're seeing in terms of Sino-Russian alliance is it's not really alliance. It's definitely a strategic partnership. I think it's a strategic partnership that gets uh, strained um, by the longer the war in the Ukraine plays out, because I'm not sure if it's in China's interest. Um, to be siding with Russia on that side. And it's certainly not a mutual defensive um, partnership. Uh, so I think we might see some uh, more of China and Russia acting in the North, but I think that the, uh, the consequences of the Ukraine uh, and, and the economic sanctions aren't necessarily pushing uh, China and Russia to be more working more together in the Arctic in that sense. That's something that we haven't seen yet. I'm not sure that we're gonna see it in the long term either, uh, given the political uh, divergence uh, and political independence uh, of, of those two countries. Uh, lastly, just you know, the third question. So, if this is the change and the consequences that we're seeing, what's where's where's this put Canada? What are the military consequences affecting Canada? What's potentially Canada's next move? Um, you know, although I think there's no change to the imminent threat level uh, in the Arctic region, the prudent response I think is to now renew and recharge our readiness for northern operations, given the shift in the security mindset, not just within uh, 
allies in Europe, but also uh, North America. Uh, would assess there be an increased demand for presence within our own AOR uh, in, in line with current policy frameworks. And as well, I think there might be a draw to participate in uh, more Northern operations in the high North on the European side with NATO uh, for reassurance and, and combined deterrence. Um, I think also uh, for Canada, it's gonna be a focused look at our infrastructure uh, and our operational support uh, structure. Um, as uh, Andrew points out, there's, there needs to be a holistic look at what our continental defense mechanisms are and what our continental defense concept is, and not just in the sense of uh, NORAD modernizing of aging systems, but to better detect and deny in, in all six of the means, as, as she mentioned, and one of them being the maritime as well. So I, I agree that we also have to look at our C2 structures that are going to best work, um, the C2 gaps, uh, and I think the future role of NORAD may be a little bit more complex and so we've seen an accelerated move in this direction from government. I think we're going to see a lot over the summer as to which direction uh, Canada is going to go in this domain. But I think this is some of the some of the um, the key tellers. Uh, so just to recap, I think really any analysis has to come from the starting point of what has changed and what has not changed. Uh, and I think that's important to consider as we're dealing with the uncertainty uh, is to to keep on looking at what the adversary is doing, not just what they're saying, and what's changed and what hasn't changed. Why are we seeing the new focus in the Arctic Collective to better operate and interoperate in the environment? I think it comes from a place to better managing our deterrence models, what is actually being effective as a deterrent, and to not underestimate potential, potential adversary action in, in any domain. Um, also, in judging what the military consequences are, I think we need uh, deterrence to be not just about numbers, scale, size, uh, but it really about a, a readiness and willingness to respond and to be able to show that we have that willingness to respond uh, if we're called upon to do so. We we'll also have to take into consideration the threats to the Arctic and in the Arctic uh, that are not being played out any differently uh, because of Russian aggression. And those include the economic security pieces, the um, human security, uh, climate change, you name it. A lot of things that we still need to be addressing from a security mindset that aren't necessarily related to uh, what's going on with Russia. I think thirdly, though, when we look at the Canadian response, I think it's key that we uh, adjust our thinking into our role where we can be appropriately postured both through leadership amongst the Arctic nations, leadership within NATO, but also within the continental defense framework. And I think that's what we're doing is enforcing our own sovereignty through diplomacy. And our participation in forums is very important, but will eventually be measured by our abilities and our posture. And so I think we're taking steps to make sure that we can achieve these uh, in the long term as well. So I'll close there. I look forward to hearing the other panelists and, and also questions. Thank you very much, Captain Jake French. I'm, I'm looking forward to some more of these conversations around uh, the on the ground operations and changes in our Arctic um, specifically that um, might start to address some of those infrastructure challenges and, and make relations between our domestic and interna international posturing. At this point, I will pass it off to Dr. Thomas Hughes for his opening remarks. Wonderful, thank you. So I have a snazzy PowerPoint presentation, which I will just pull up for us all. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for, for inviting me on the panel. It's a, it's a real honour and pleasure to, to be involved with, with the, my fellow panellists, really. And I think this is a fascinating question, uh, because the war in Ukraine, obviously, and, and reasonably and understandably, is, has drawn a huge amount of attention um, to the, the, the region of Ukraine in particular, but, but thinking about sort of the, the ripple effects beyond that um, in the military sense is, is really important. And I think a lot of my comments are, are going to really sort of build on what Captain French talked about. Uh, and my understanding of, of what has the, the war in Ukraine changed for the Arctic is, is basically everything and nothing. Everything's changed and absolutely nothing's changed. Um, so with that sort of slightly philosophical start, um, when I talk about uh, what I see as the, the military effects in Ukraine, uh, uh, in the Arctic of the, the war in Ukraine, I want to split it down into to two different sets of approaches, if you like, uh, sort of little two by two grid. And the first is thinking about uh, different Arctics. I know that most of us are, are aware that of the problems when we talk about the Arctic as a, a single monolith. Um, and for the purposes of this presentation, I want to talk about North American Arctic and European Arctic. Uh, I appreciate that there are the crude conceptualizations. We could certainly go into more detail about different bits, but please bear with me on that one. So obviously for the North American Arctic, we're really looking at Northern Canada and Alaska, Europe and Northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, and uh, a little bit of Russia as well. 
But the second differentiation that I want to, to bring up here is um, changes in, in a balance. And, and by that, I mean um, both changes in capability. Do we actually see any shifts in, in the capability of conducting uh, oper successful military operations in the Arctic or either one of those two Arctics? But perhaps more importantly, um, have there been changes in, in how those two regions are seen in a military context? And what are the perceptions of intent? Because I think, as, as Captain Friend pointed out, that, that is ultimately what underscores all of our activities, um, not just the, the capability point. So starting um, with the, the capability, uh, first of all, I suppose it's, it's perhaps the most straightforward one. And from, from what I've seen in the North American Arctic, there's been very little uh, in terms of changes. Uh, again, following uh, Whitney Lackenbauer's um, brilliant conceptions of threats in and, and through the Arctic. Um, threats in the Arctic, as has been said, uh, the chances of large-scale land-based warfare in North America in the Arctic is basically um, non-existent. Uh, and I don't think we've seen a great deal um, due to the war in Ukraine. That's that's changed that. Similarly, threats through, which obviously are uh, perhaps a more um, a significant threat in general. It's, it's understood as a, a, a potential um, route to attack a, a target in in North America. Um, although that threat has remained kind of broadly the same sort of level in terms of the capability of conducting such operations. My understanding is, and I'm, I'm glad Captain French sort of <laughs> backed this one up. We haven't seen a great deal in in terms of changes due to the war uh, in Ukraine. So North America, I think, from the capability side, we can we can kind of put to one side for, for the moment, at least for the, the sort of short term. In Europe, however, I think the situation is really quite different. Uh, and the, the primary driver of this is the, uh, okay, we still have to call it potential, but likely probable um, accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO. And that really does reshape uh, the Arctic balance. And one point that I do think is, is interesting, I mean, Russia, although they, they didn't interfere with cold response in the same way they did with Trident Juncture, um, they did, uh, as they always do, um, raise some concerns about the exercise going on. If you want more information about why Russia does that, see my dissertation. Um, it's a thrilling read. Um, but in particular here, the point that I really wanted to, to draw out is this uh, comment about the risk of unintended incidents. And I think that's uh, almost a side point when we have a, a hot war, a horrible conflict going on in Ukraine, but this idea that actually Finland and Sweden do join NATO and we do see larger exercises, more frequent exercises, quite simply it puts more people on the ground, on the water, in the air, and the potential for an unintended incident or an accident, an unintended escalation increases. So I think it's going to be really important that we continue to, to look at that uh, and mitigate those sorts of risks and engage in the dialogue which, which mitigates that. Secondly, that extended sovereignty protection, just joining NATO obviously has a huge impact on, on Sweden and Finland. We know that they've been broadly aligned with NATO over the last few years, um, at least, but now this, this changes things somewhat significantly. Again, I, I don't think it's the case that we anticipated that Russia would invade Swin uh, Sweden or Finland if um, they weren't part of NATO, but it does nevertheless change the, the dynamic somewhat um, because of that extended protection. The caveat I would put in place, however, is the comment from, from Sergei Lavrov, which essentially said, well, we always just saw Finland and Sweden as part of NATO anyway. So this doesn't change how we as Russia um, look at, at security in, in um, Northern Europe. I'll come back to the ellipsis at the end of that quote uh, in a couple of slides time however, because it's, it's quite interesting. One minor point that I would like to, to bring up though, which has been mentioned a couple of times on, on Twitter and in other places, um, but I think it's worth pointing out. So as I, I'm sure most of us are aware, um, a significant proportion of, of Russia's um, Naval capability for the Arctic is up in the Kola Peninsula and around Mamansk uh, and Severomorsk. Now, um, my understanding is that trying to um, disrupt naval operations there would be very difficult uh, at the moment for, for NATO for all sorts of geographical and, and capability based re reasons. But what I think is really interesting is that Mamansk seems to be linked um, to the rest of Russia by a single road, which is just shy of 800 kilometers long, according to Google Maps. And I think this is an interesting point. That's a huge vulnerability for, for Russia. Again, we could say, well, if we get to the point where we are talking about how to break that line of communication, we are in a serious, serious conflict. 
Um, but nevertheless, I think it, when we, we talk about capability changes and how that might feed into interpretation, expectation and perception of threat, I think that's quite important to note. Again, if we look at it from Finland itself, it's only about 165 kilometers um, at, at its shortest point between the two. So it, this might be a minor point in the grand scheme of things, but when we do think about that balance of capability, I think it's, it's worth bearing in mind. So moving on to the perception of intent, and I think this is also extremely interesting because from my perspective, that actually the reverse seems to be, be true here. I think there is a potential significant shift in um, perceptions of intent, understanding of, of the potential for something bad to happen in North America. I think that has changed more um, than it has in Europe. Now, it doesn't mean that it's greater in North America than it is in Europe, but I think the change due to the war in Ukraine is, is the interesting point here. Uh, and the, the first point I'd like to make in, in the context of North America, I think we've seen over the last few years this idea of, of Russia weaponizing risk, essentially playing the brinkmanship card, um, working pretending to work within the rules when they're not actually working within the rules. Everyone knows they're not, but they are just trying to push things a little bit further. What we've seen with the invasion of Ukraine in February is that they've just blown that weaponization of risk out the water and essentially they've manifested that, that threat. So I think this is going to, to really um, cause a little bit of a, a, a pause in how we understand Russia's actions in the North American Arctic. Can we actually take at face value their, um, their, their continued conversations about uh, wanting dialogue? Secondly, there is, of course, this delicacy of political engagement uh, at, at the moment. Um, the concerns about militarizing the Arctic, which have already been, been brought up, um, and of course, the optics of engaging with Russia at the moment. It'd be very difficult for us to, to speak to Russia without um, as Macron uh, has, has found without looking like you are or being accused of undermining um, Ukraine's position. So I think it's, it's increasingly important that we do have some conversations in the not too distant future, but it's gonna be very difficult to do that. And I think that that's a, uh, an interesting shift. In Europe, whilst we've got some, um, uh, some commentators saying the security situation has, has changed, um, I, that is absolutely the, the case. But again, going back to, to Lavrov's point about actually, um, we saw Sweden and Finland as part of, of NATO essentially anyway. Um, but that, that ellipsis that I put, uh, the, the last time I put this quote up is, you know, let's see how their territory is used in practice. So I put that, that caveat in there, let's, let's wait and see um, what happens in terms of NATO's basing uh, in those regions. Um, and I think that one is important as well because uh, as Captain French said, we don't know how the, the Ukraine war is going to finish. Um, we don't know when it's going to finish. We don't, don't know what it's going to look like there. Um, so it's, it's difficult to tell. And, and just one very final point. Um, the fact that cold response still went ahead, and from what I could see, and I'm happy, if, I'd be delighted if anyone could tell me any different, it didn't seem like there were any significant changes to what occurred in that exercise um, from the original plan for the exercise. Now, I know that the, 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 the time difference between cold response starting and you, the, the war in Ukraine starting was very short and shifting what happens in an exercise of that size would have been extremely difficult and costly and unfortunate. Um, but the fact that it did continue kind of as planned was interesting to me because I think it suggested a kind of business as usual, despite the fact that we've got this huge dislocating conflict um, that has just emerged in Ukraine. So uh, I hope that's of some interest and I'll pass it back across to, to Jackie. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was um, really interesting. And I have, you guys are answering my questions before I can ask them. So I'm diligently writing down new questions here in the background. Um, at this point, I would like to pass it on to Dr. Rebecca Pinker for her opening. Great, thank you. Um, uh, one thing that's great about speaking last is that I get to sort of fat clean up and all of my all of the previous speakers have offered such excellent perspectives and overviews so I feel like I have very little to add. Um, these have all been really insightful talks Andrea's fantastic overview Captain French's focus on sort of Canadian uh, Navy and, and military equities and, and Thomas's um, terrific deep dive onto uh, Russia and, and NATO balances. So thank you all to all of those previous speakers. I do need to note that um, 
while I am an employee of the United States Navy, I'm not presenting the official position of the Navy or the Department of Defense. These are just my personal reflections. Um, so that being said, let me let me dive right in with just a few sort of, you know, these are, this is just icing on the top of the cake that has already been built. Um, I would agree that in general, not much has changed. And I think I'd like to kind of place that in some context. You know, I think, um, there's uh, the metaphor of, of uh, a frog in a pot of boiling water, right? It heats up very slowly and you don't realize what's going on. And um, I think we're at a point now where really for the last decade, Russia has been cranking up the heat on us, starting with the invasion of Georgia um, and then obviously Crimea in 2014. And um, Ukraine simply just turned the heat up very fast. And so it's an exacerbation of trends that have been going on. Um, and I think this latest, and certainly most extreme, right? I mean, uh, Georgia was, a, was a, a pretty significant amount of fighting. Um, Crimea had the sort of plausible cover of little green men, but massive land warfare in Ukraine is um, just a really significant escalation. And that has forced us to make some changes that I think have been long coming. Um, since Crimea, since 2015, we have seen um, a NATO increase um, operations, exercises, deterrence signaling of all the kinds that Andrea mentioned and that Captain French mentioned. Um, we have seen more significant exercises as Thomas has talked about. We've seen a, certainly a lot more rhetoric about um, deterring Russia, a more significant focus on the high north, but it has not um, I think between 2015 and, and, you know, February, there were some important sort of um, loose spots. And I think in the last three months, we've seen a lot of tightening up. And so I would point specifically to coordination among NATO allies, um, really uh, significantly sort of strengthened and um, tightened up in the last couple of months in ways that speak to the dangers that I think all the previous speakers have mentioned of unintended escalation. If you're conducting more exercises, larger exercises, more complex exercises proximate to Russian forces um, in the Barents and the Norwegian seas, and we know Russia conducts unsafe um, activities around and in response to those exercises, you need to be very careful to button those up to make sure nothing happens. Um, and I think in the last few months, we have seen some really good steps towards um, a very high level of coordination. Um, I think, you know, it's not an Arctic example, but in the Mediterranean, we've had three separate carrier groups, um, a US, a French and Italian group exercising together under NATO, um, proximate to a Russian naval strike force uh, for months. And you know nothing has happened and that's fantastic. That is an indication of a really advanced um, and perfected level of C2 uh, command and control in a, a very you know, complex environment, multiple um, carrier groups. Uh, and that's fantastic. And we need to maintain that, right? I think that's something that, that uh, Captain French alluded to. We're, we're at a point now where um, we are tightly coordinated, we're sharing a lot of information. Um, NATO is really um, operating at um, uh, a, a very advanced level to coordinate, to look at areas that maybe we weren't looking at closely enough, like logistics, like resupply, um, like intelligence sharing. And we've known we've needed to do that for the last five or six years. But this has been the impetus to sort of finally get it dialed in. Um, another point that I think we're seeing um, some movement on in response to Ukraine would be intelligence sharing. Um, Andrea spoke to that a little bit. You know, we have known for you know several years now that um, intelligence sharing could be improved in the high north. Um, that sensors are missing. There are you know. Um, there's gaps in our domain awareness and our ability to sense incoming threats uh, in North America. And I think that's the conversation around um, domain awareness and intelligence sharing has taken a significant step forward in the last couple of months. 
Um, I think we've seen with Ukraine the um, effectiveness of sort of a strategy of uh, declassification, right? The effects of sharing intelligence as widely as possible. Um, and so I think that we're at a point now where um, whether through NATO or through other venues, we're sharing a lot more intelligence with our allies and partners, and that's really fantastic. Um, and again, that's that sort of buttoning up our side of the house, recognizing that Russia is engaging in bad faith actions. And so we need to be as sort of buttoned up as we can. Um, again, we need to maintain that intelligence sharing, make sure that the really fantastic steps that have been taken in the last few months in response to the invasion stay in place. How do we make sure that when we go back to business as usual, we don't lose our ability to practice advanced C2, to share intelligence readily, to um, have logistics and um, resupply and you know the amazing resupply uh, connections and, and, and pathways that are, have been built in the last three months. I don't, we can't lose that. So I think that's sort of um, the second area is sort of we've, we've, I want to highlight that um, we're doing things in the last few months that we have needed to do for several years. We're doing a great job right now. We need to make sure those stay baked in. Um, the last piece that I want to talk about is um, not sort of getting carried away. And I think over the last several years, we have seen a lot of rhetoric about the Arctic security threat, right? Um, and in some quarters, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has added even more fuel to the idea that there is a security crisis in the Arctic. Um, and I don't think, I think we need to be careful around that rhetoric, right? We're in an environment right now where tensions are very high. It's important to avoid any kind of unnecessary um, escalation or um, some kind of escalation spiral where, um, you know, tit for tat responses get us to a place um, of, of grave danger. And so I think that's where the rhetoric needs to be closely tied to facts. Yes, Russia has been building up its military capabilities in the Arctic. Um, it's been doing so on its sovereign territory and within its sovereign rights. Um, and the primary purpose of, of its military buildup is defensive. Um, it's got enormous economic interests, core national interests in its Arctic, and it needs to be able to defend those. Um, certainly those capabilities could be used um, in the event of some kind of conflict, uh, but the idea that Russia is um, planning to invade or take over the entire Arctic, right? We hear this language tossed about, right? Russia wants to, wants to, to you know, take over the Arctic. Well, I, I, there's a great line from, um, I think a Canadian defense minister from quite a number of years ago, you know, if Russia lands an invasion force into the Canadian Arctic, what would you do? I would send out a search and rescue team, right? Um, I do think that being really clear about what type of threats are sort of urgent pressing security threats, Andrea very intelligently highlights the missile threat, right? And the need for better sensors to make sure that we are closely tracking um, next generation uh, missile delivery systems, very important. Um, from a sort of uh, invasion perspective, I think that is um, rhetoric that these days can lead us to a fairly dangerous place pretty quickly. So I do believe in being very specific about what are the threats to um, North America, to NATO, and what are the appropriate responses, um, and making sure that we're consulting in this very closely, particularly with our allies who are in the region because we know that um, our Nordic allies or Nordic NATO allies and Nordic NATO partners, potentially soon to be allies, share these land borders with Russia and they will be at the forefront of any um, uh, responses, right? They will feel the brunt of uh, increase, increasing tension. Um, and so I believe involving them in sort of our uh, 
our deterrence response is very important. I think that's also a big piece of reassurance, right? Um, so I think that approach, which again, is something we've been doing very closely in the last three months. I hope we can continue to consult very closely with our allies, build these well-coordinated, um, very advanced capability um, exercises and operations that signal clearly alliance resolve and strength without being provocative and without engaging in rhetoric that um, might contribute to the development of a security dilemma in the region. Um, and I know I've picked up on, on threads that these speakers have, the, the preceding speakers have all mentioned. So I, I don't wanna go into any further details. I wanna hear questions. Um, but I think my takeaway is we have seen a fantastic response that in many ways I think is um, a testament to the strength of the NATO Alliance and um, the ability of the great folks um, in NATO militaries. Um, and hopefully that will continue. Um, as many of these speakers have said, we don't know yet what the future has will bring. We do know that Russia is, um, is not going anywhere. And so we are in this for the long haul. Um, and uh, so I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Those are, um, thanks for weaving it all together so eloquently. We, I know that Andrea has to leave, and so I'm going to throw a question out there quite quickly, and Andrea will ask for your response first, and, and we will miss you for the second part of the, uh, of the question piece, but uh, ahead of your departure, I would just like to thank you for, for joining us and for all of your really important um, pieces around this conversation. So I am going to start with something that you've already um, mentioned about the on-ramps. Um, where do you envision there to be diplomatic on ramps to normalize relations with Russia in the future? I know that we that you briefly spoke about the um, ground level scientist to scientist, indigenous to indigenous um, piece. I, I, you know, I would enjoy some speculation even about uh, some of the higher higher level um, political on ramps that you see potentially coming down the, the pipe as we move past. Um, the current position that we have uh, of not taking these meetings at this point. So I will pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do think, um, you know, the, the really unfortunate um, side effect of the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine is our attention to many other conflicts in the world has been sidetracked. Um, many of the really important scientific uh, projects that were just at the point of completion um, have again been put to the side. And many of these projects are trying to find best practices given climate change. And we know especially the Arctic feels the climate change more acutely. We're seeing changes in migration patterns, you name it. And so I, I really think that things like those uh, scientific projects um, that we try and get those going again, because, uh, you know, Russia of all the Arctic states is feeling the climate change the most uh, because of their poor climate change practices to begin with, their, their over-reliance on fossil fuels, their whole GDP is premised on an idea that just cannot continue in the future. And so that, in addition to the sanctions, is not going to encourage uh, Russia to be you know, supporting uh, green technology. So those, I think those scientific working groups, if there is a way for them to continue some of those projects, those are really important. The permanent participants too um, are really essential to this because their boundaries uh, are not the same as the state boundaries. And so, for example, the Inuit Circumpolar Council has uh, Inuit representation from Russia, the US, Canada, and Greenland. And uh, their idea of sovereignty is different, a little bit different from state sovereignty, but those connections are so important. And unfortunately, the states made a decision to put the Arctic Council on hiatus without consulting the permanent participants before that decision was made. Nevertheless, the majority have um, been supportive of the steps, but um, nothing precludes them 
from still engaging. And I'm hoping that Arctic states continue to provide them those resources and support so that can happen. Um, if there was one of the higher level organizations that was going to get up and running again, I would suggest the Arctic Coast Guard Forum is probably the most likely. And that's because its focus is on search and rescue best practices and oil spill cleanup. And all of us can see that uh, no good comes from not cooperating and then having a massive oil spill um, that will affect all the Arctic states because of the currents that operate in the Arctic. It will devastate uh, indigenous cultural practices I think that is a good one to recommence. Um, in many cases, it's also because there's a combination of some military representation from some of the Arctic states, but also safety and civilian um, organizations. So it, it's a mandate and a mix that I think lends itself to being, again, one of the ones that we need to start sooner or later. Thank you very much, Kendra. Um, and I will pass it. I will just keep going in the same order unless somebody would like to interject. Um, please, you know, put your hand up or your virtual hand up. Um, but otherwise, I'll pass it to uh, Tim French. Yeah, I think that's that's a very great question. So it's super pertinent. I, I I really have to agree with Andrea on that um, on the points of what can what is really important to be reinitiated. I feel like there's been a uh, <clears throat> within those forums, there's definitely a sense that there was just on the cusp of really important things to do and to progress. Uh, and with the pause, uh, such as the Arctic Coast Guard Forum on pause for any sort of a live and in-person meetings, um, that work being on hold, uh, long-term consequences that are not going to be good. So I think too, what, what important thing to keep in mind is um, yeah, the, the you know how long is is Russia the chair of the Arctic Council? What is what effect is that going to have uh, to when we get the Arctic Council back on again? Is the Arctic Council going to recommence just based on cessation of hostilities in the Ukraine, or is there going to be more conditions uh, on Russia to bring it back in? So I think the West is going to have to be very careful about what uh, conditions are met in order for Russia to rejoin, because it could be put permanently on pause if our conditions are way too drastic. Uh, and don't consider the separation of the Arctic region to what's going on in the rest of the world. And so we're trying to keep it a very low tension, uh, sort of a, an off valve as opposed to uh, a competition valve. Um, but yeah, the Coast Guard Forum definitely key. I think there's a lot of partners, there's a lot of Arctic Rim states that will communicate with Russia and are communicating with Russia now uh, through things like Coast Guard, through things like search and rescue, uh, probably through things like environment. And they're gonna have to continue to do that. I think the, the danger is that if it doesn't, go through the Arctic Council, then it may become a little bit more unilateral, bilateral. Uh, it doesn't have that multilateral sense of what's what's governing the region. So we have to be very careful that the longer it's put on pause, but the more dialogue starts going through Russia, it's going to go through various means. It's not going to necessarily be under the purview of the Arctic Council if it's paused. So we just have to be conscious of the fact that the longer it's on pause, these conversations are going to have to happen. It's going to happen by necessity. And we don't, and, and even the US Coast Guard communicating with Russian Coast Guard on the other side of the bearing, you know, with the Arctic Council, we had a way of making sure that multilaterally that was working. It was in, within international rules. Uh, and I think that's that's going to be key. But I do think uh, those are some of the non-military, non-uniform forums uh, that may assist. Uh, we do have to make sure that um, I, I think that that diplomatic uh, side gets back uh, once the conditions are right to do so. Thank you very much. And I will pass it uh, to Thomas for your Super, thank you. So um, briefly, perhaps I'm a, a stuck in the 1980s, but I, I really love talking about confidence building measures and the, the idea of openness and transparency as a potential route to stopping certain forms of conflict. And that certain form of conflict is the, the unanticipated escalation. And, and one of the very, very few academic hills that I'm prepared to die on is that the Arctic is a region in which the potential for unintended escalation is probably higher than anywhere else on the planet. I think, as we've all heard, the chances of actual deliberate conflict is, is quite low. But I think the possibility of an accident leading to something else occurring is a real problem. Uh, and I think that's a potential route uh, a, a very gently sloping on ramp. I mean, we've already talked about the the, uh, the ideas um, uh, around the the way in which um, 
care has been taken in exercises and the like. And I think potentially that could be formalized a little bit more. What happens if we set up a, a channel of communication, even if it's just an, a norm rather than a rule at present, a, a, a norm of giving better indication of what exercises are about to occur, um, uh, numbers of troops involved, uh, essentially something similar-ish to the 2011 Vienna document, obviously tweaked a lot for, for the Arctic. And, and I think from there, it's possible that um, we could actually see some genuinely valuable uh, confidence building measures in the Arctic, which are specific to both Arctic security and even more importantly, avoiding the trap that, that uh, confidence building in, in Europe fell into and actually being more focused on the specific concerns of the states involved in the Arctic. Um, but I think there's a potential on-ramp to start with, just setting up that communication uh, around what military activities are going to be occurring because there is this shared, um, it seems to be anyway, a, a shared interest in, in deconfliction. Um, and I think that might be an interesting way to start. Now, I, I, I don't know what forum that should occur in, frankly, and how that should come up, but that's, uh, that's for other people to sort out. I just come up with the idea. Thank you very much. Um, Rebecca. This is a tough question. Um, I have to say I am, um, you know, I think events of the last few months have demonstrated um, quite clearly that um, we should have low expectations of Russia as an interlocutor. Um, I am bearish on confidence building measures. Um, with due respect to Thomas, I think there is um, little reason to expect Russia to engage in those in good faith. Um, and uh, Similarly, um, I'm, I'm somewhat bearish on um, significant progress being made through the Coast Guard Forum and the Arctic Council. Um, I certainly believe that working level projects through the Coast Guard Forum and the Arctic Council um, would be a great place to recommence. I think that's certainly the most likely place um, of renewed work. I don't think high level contacts, um, even in a multilateral forum like that are um, worth the cost in terms of the renormalization signal that they would send, um, which is what Russia very badly wants, right? We should be very careful to make sure that we are getting some benefit out of whatever price we are paying and I think when it comes to renormalization, the clear beneficiary there is Russia. And unless there's a very um, unmistakable benefit uh, to the West, I don't think we should pay that cost right now. I think Russia is desperately looking for renormalization and they're a bad faith dialogue partner. So I don't think um, re-engaging in dialogue for the sake of dialogue actually pays us any benefit. Um, that being said, uh, I think where there are sort of clear areas of top priority, working level contacts need to resume. And, you know, the threat of oil spills is a good one. Um, but there are other areas outside the Arctic that I think are higher priority, arms control, um, space. Uh, you know, some of the other fields where we have, you know, really significant global equities uh, that touch on Russia. Climate change, right? We're not gonna be able to, to meet Paris Accords and prevent a climate catastrophe without Russia. I don't know what that looks like at all. Um, and uh, one more that is Arctic specific that I think is very important. Um, Russia has uh, a number of uh, nuclear reactors and submarines on the, on the floor of the Kara Sea in the Arctic. Those are rusting, um, it's terrifying. And there was a lot of international cooperation cleaning up nuclear waste in the Arctic. Um, that would be a timely area to recommence sort of working level contacts. Um, the last piece that I wanna throw in here, I'm sure it's gonna come up again. When we think about sort of on ramps and renormalization, it's gonna be really important to watch the Chinese Russia relationship. And I think um, watching that and thinking about a broader geopolitical strategy that deals with competition uh, 
um, and the relationship between those two actors is really important. I would, I would urge sort of a broad approach to thinking about on-ramps rather than carving it up into little stovepipes because I think the potential unintended consequences of a um, ad hoc approach uh, could be collectively adverse to our interests. Thanks. Thank you for those perspectives. Um, I do have a couple of questions coming in and I will uh, direct them uh, after I, I have one more that I would really like to ask uh, before we move over. So I will do that. Um, and that is with the current moving, movement happening within NATO and changes in, expected in terms of membership, is NATO more or less likely to adopt an Arctic strategy? And then how important is this? Um, so I will I'll throw it back to Captain Fred. Oh, well, thanks, Jackie. I, I don't think that's an easy one to uh, to answer. I think, um, but it, I'm intrigued by the question because uh, it, it just opens up that that uh, something I hadn't really thought about. Um, the you know, I think there's been there's some there's been some good discussion about what Sweden and Finland's um, uh, bringing them into the NATO alliance actually really means uh, for for NATO. Uh, Russia's response saying, well, we kind of saw them as NATO anyway. Uh, they're closely aligned, not going to make too much difference to us, but, but you know, with the caveat that, that Thomas mentioned. I think, though, um, I think one of the most interesting things to me to see play out is if Sweden and Finland are now part of NATO and are part of uh, seven Arctic nations, uh, making up the Arctic Council, uh, then the rest of the Arctic Council is basically NATO other than Russia, uh, what, what the dynamic is there. I think um, the Arctic nations that are, that are seven, Minus, minus Russia, uh, will have to come up, they have their own interests, own national strategies, own um, uh, views of what the regional interests uh, in the Arctic. And I think that seven group of seven is going to try to shape uh, how much interaction, what, what NATO's role will be there. Um, and uh, because when you're bringing in NATO, you're bringing in all sorts of people that are not Arctic players into the region as well. So I think that's going to be the interesting dialogue with the Arctic Rim states, uh, including Sweden and Finland. Now that Sweden and Finland are into NATO, do you need uh, uh, a new Arctic strategy? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that a new NATO Arctic strategy is coming soon. Um, I would probably argue that NATO wants to see itself as always for having a, a NATO. There's always been a threat to the north. There's always been a northern flank. There's always been NATO reasons to act in the north and in the Arctic. And what we're seeing now is that NATO's involvement in the region is less, is more than episodic, uh, is a little bit more permanent, and it's probably becoming a little bit more status quo to be there than to, than to not. Um, but I don't know if that's going to form into an Arctic strategy just based on, on Sweden and Finland coming into the NATO fold. I do think, though, it's going to really be an interesting dialogue amongst Arctic Rim states as to what their role is uh, uh, with uh, the NATO membership there. Uh, compared to just the role of NATO at large uh, in the region, I think that's going to be interesting. But so I, I, I'd hazard that it's an important question. Um, it, we do have to be unified uh, in what the strategy is, but there's so many different national interests out there. I think that's going to be difficult difficult to uh, put together in the short term. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, as this has been recorded, I want to say yes and then pause and then say no, and we can clip it in a couple of years' time, and I'll be be right on all counts. Um, I, I think that was a really interesting interesting response. Before I, I my I'm inclined to agree. I, I think the the possibility of a, a unified Arctic strategy seems um, uh, it, it's so much of a challenge to create one that I think it's going to be a little while before we, we see it. But I think what's also important to know, I, mean, I know that the, the Arctic strategy um, wouldn't necessarily cover everything that's happening there, but I, I think it's also worth thinking again about the different threats that emanate um, around the, the Arctic. So, um, and, and particularly certain threats, which, which might kind of stem in part from the Arctic, uh, but not be directly related to it. So, for example, if we wanted to talk about um, the, the transportation of, of troops and equipment by sea from North America to Europe, if Russia was going to try to intercept that, if they were going to send submarines to attack a convoy, where are they going to come from? Well, potentially they come from in a base that is inside the Arctic Circle. So does that have to form part of an Arctic strategy? Does that, like, convoy defence, is that about an Arctic? So I think... 
I think there's um, th there are an awful lot of of complexities in, in creating it, um, and I think it does feel like we're going to wait and see sort of how the how the dust settles, what posture Russia takes over the next five years, and then that will enable NATO to see how to fit Sweden and Finland in most effectively to 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 posture against the threat that they see in Europe. Thank you, Thomas and Rebecca. You can back clean up again. Um, you know, excellent insights. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. And I think um, the one, one additional piece I'll offer is that um, NATO has, I think, some um, significant challenges uh, that might take precedence over developing an Arctic strategy. Not only is it just sort of very difficult because it's a huge alliance and everything it does is pretty slow um, when it comes to sort of formal strategies, but um, you know, the focus on the Eastern flank is going to be the top priority and it should be right now, right? There is a war going on in Ukraine. Um, and so I think the top priority is NATO's Eastern flank and, you know, looking at the Baltic states and the other parts of Eastern flank to see where there may be any weaknesses that need to be patched up, where those allies need, um, you know, whatever additional resources to ensure that that's um, a strong and formidable alliance wall. Um, and so, you know, yes, that's a top priority for, for NATO and will be for as long as this war is going on. Um, secondly, you know, um, NATO has a Turkey problem right now. Uh, Turkey continues to block Swedish and Finnish membership. Um, it's purchased S-400 systems from Russia. It wants F-35s, those don't play well together. Um, and, uh, you know, until we can, I think NATO, I think this spat with Turkey over Sweden and Finnish membership is um, adding fuel to sort of an ongoing challenge of Turkey's place in the NATO alliance, it's sort of transactional approach to NATO. Um, more broadly, there are, there's democratic backsliding among a handful of NATO members. Um, and so I think that sort of challenging um, management, organizational management question is going to be another problem for NATO to tackle. And um, I would not see sort of major new developments outside of the sort of Eastern flank, like an Arctic strategy um, in the current context in which there's sort of these um, actors like Turkey inside NATO that are um, making it more challenging. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical that we would see a NATO Arctic strategy anytime soon, quite frankly. Thank you. I'm going to move on to, I'm just going between chat and Q&A. We have questions in both places, so I will um, start to address some of those now. Um, the first one, are, are the current amount of military exercises in the Arctic adequate or do you expect an increase in the months and years to come? Um, so I'm just gonna keep going in the same order, but make sure I catch everybody all the time. Um, so uh, Captain French, you get to lead it off again. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, based on what I was presenting in the initial remarks and, and kind of give that impression of how we're going to, uh, you know, accelerate into that field and get more and more into that domain and, and show that we're doing it. Um, you know, that's, um, I think that there can, there's an argument made that we need to be obviously doing more of that if we are going to be um, deterring in the right way, deterring uh, adversaries' actions in the right way in, in that particular region. I think it's, in, but it does come at a cost uh, and it does come at a cost compared to other, where else we also wanna be engaged in the world. And as Rebecca's mentioned, you know, there is a war in the Ukraine, it's still going on. That is a, that Eastern flank and uh, bolstering our NATO, part, NATO allies and that Eastern flank, Poland, you name it, is very, very important. So that it does come at a cost. So. How much of what we are putting into um, northern operations and being able to operate in the north is going to be long lasting, I think will be a key question. I think Canada is there in terms of what we want to do long term. Um, but it does it does come at a cost me as it's a conscious decision to be made. Um, I have obviously with my job, the way we operate Joint Task Force North, I'd love to be able to say, yes, we need to be doing obviously more and more, but I'm conscious of, of the fact that um, with everything else that we have going on, 
the amount that we're going to dedicate to a northern military exercise and operation has to be a conscious decision uh, based on everything else that we have going on. Um, but to, back to the original point, I think in order to be effective uh, in the region, um, that we have to be able to show that interoperability piece. I think the, the, the tightening up that Rebecca was mentioning of, of allies is that tactical integration, operational integration, and showing that uh, in terms of the right amount of frequency, probably the right scale, uh, such that it's not overly provocative and, and doesn't build up a, a, a new different rhetoric that's perhaps dangerous is probably very important. Um, so I think we just have to be smarter and, and not necessarily um, more, more, and more and more up there because unless I think we have, we mentioned that we don't really need the NATO strategy, but I think we do need a common approach uh, to how often and, and, and what scale we're gonna operate up there uh, such that it isn't, um, doesn't become dangerous. And I think we have, to be, we have to make sure that the competition doesn't necessarily become confrontational and the confrontation becomes conflict. So, um, you know, but in the sense of uh, what we do from a security standpoint, all sorts of other security standpoints, uh, security problems that we try to do uh, in the North, in the Canadian Arctic, whether that be working with Coast Guard on, uh, you know, a, a constabulary war or RCMP in a constabulary war or putting up uh, into the Canadian Arctic, something that works uh, from a security mindset between Alaska and Canada. All that type of stuff. I think we need to continue to, to work that problem set because it's always existed, uh, not necessarily because of a, of a recent uh, conflict in, in Europe. Thank you, Thomas. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just just quickly. I think the, the adequacy phrase is a really interesting one because I think it, it requires the next question: Is it adequate for what? What what are we trying to achieve through this? Um, so. Now, are we trying to enable us to do X? Well, what is also that that X? If we if we're saying actually the real threat is through the Arctic from missiles, well, maybe our exercises are not adequate because it's a group of folks on the ground rolling around in the snow, and that's not going to change anything. And the reverse might also be the case. But that, but I think that that you know when we talk about adequacy, I think we really need to be be careful with that. And of course, the the real challenge is. Are we going to expect an increase in the months to come? My understanding for, for a large scale NATO exercise is that the planning process takes an awful long time. So actually, we need to be really careful, I think, when we look at exercises. So very often we see a large scale exercise or another exercise happening in temporal proximity to a thing. And we see it as a reaction. And that's not always the case. In fact, it's not necessarily often the case. Like if you were to look at cold response, in isolation, the, the last cold response, you might say, well, OK, Russia invaded Ukraine. NATO needs to show that it's present and together. So we did cold response. Well, we all know that's not true, but I, but I think it, it's perhaps an indication of, of, of the care with which we need to, to frame exercises. Um, <clears throat> and maybe confidence building measures might help with framing. But anyway, that, that's uh, perhaps a, a different conversation for Rebecca and I to have. But I, I think uh, the, the point that uh, was made just before as well about reassuring allies is really important and I think looking at, at Trident Juncture, the last two iterations of Trident Juncture were a phenomenal example of how NATO has done that. The first being in the hot and sunny climes of, of Spain and Italy and, and Greece for the most part and the second being up in Norway and it, it's a real challenge for, for NATO to, to demonstrate um, that uh, that collective understanding of the different threats and, and ability to and willingness to work to understand and respond to different understandings of threats um, amongst different different allies. So uh, I, I think it's um, will we see exercises. But one of the challenges for NATO as well is looking at what is the threat going to be in two years time or three years time or four years time because we need to start exercising for that threat right now. Um, so I. In terms of an increase, I think we probably will see an increase, but um, in terms of whether they are adequate or not, I think it's a fascinating question, but depends on what we understand to be the threat environment in 2030. Thank you, Thomas. Rebecca. Excellent points again. Um, I have very little to add. I think both Captain French and Thomas touched on um, what I think of as sort of the cowbell problem, I don't know if you all are familiar with that SNL skit, but the idea that um, we just sort of need more, right, and more in itself is, is better. Um, I don't think we need more, right? we don't need more cowbell here, right? What are we trying to accomplish, as Thomas noted, and what is the cost that we're paying, as Captain French noted? And um, again, we are not operating in a sort of resource uh, limitless context, 
um, these things are expensive and troops have to come from somewhere. And right now, at least, you know, I'm just going to speak briefly from a U.S. perspective. Um, you know, the United States, the national defense strategy that just came out clearly identifies our priority competitor and focus is the PRC and our, our priority focus is the Indo-Pacific. Um, obviously, Europe is number two, and we are focused on European defense um, because of the war and, you know, in general, because of longstanding European security interests. Um, but there is um, the pacing threat with the PRC is, you know, as Thomas noted, it's it's what we're going to be doing decades from now, right? And so I think NATO has not yet fully grappled with the China problem. And if that work gets shoved aside um, to, to deal with Ukraine, it will be back. Um, and we should not sort of lose sight of that global and um, very complex problem set in our rush to sort of focus on, um, you know, the, the Russia problem right now. So I think there is this impulse to do more. I think I, I would question and want to unpack that, that impulse along the lines that our previous speaker suggested and suggest that we need to sort of be mindful of some of the other priorities we have right now. Thank you everyone for those excellent points. I do have one, um, a question that um, is directed towards Rebecca, but I think everybody will also have answers to this. So Rebecca, I will start with you and we'll see how Captain French can that clean up this time. So the question is, how would the potential weaponization of space affect Arctic security strategies in the future, along with force development initiatives such as NORAD modernization? Really interesting question, right? And that's, I mean, it's fantastic, right? Because this is one of this, these emerging problem sets where, you know, we're still sort of grappling with the implications of um, satellite proliferation, anti-satellite measures, um, which we see both uh, the PRC and Russia developing. Um, modern warfare relies on advanced, um, satellite communications and imagery. And um, those are vulnerable nodes if ASAT capabilities get fielded. Um, space weaponization is um, a major challenge. Uh, I think we're just sort of entering into that era. And um, the polar, both polar regions, Arctic and Antarctica are important to space because they offer um, access points to low Earth orbits um, and to polar orbit orbiting sat satellite paths, which are unique. Um, so we see the space dimension very important in the Arctic. Um, and that's where, for example, um, China has a satellite ground sensing station in northern Sweden um, and another one down in Antarctica, right? And, and so, you know, I think there. Um, are sort of strategic infrastructure and investment pieces to the space race that touch on Arctic equities. Um, there are uh, sort of the advances in, in high-end weaponry and some of the really exquisite systems that are being fielded these days have sort of important space elements. Um, that goes back to some points that Andrea made before she had to hop off about the importance of NORAD modernization. There are next generation weapon systems and weapons delivery systems um, that are being fielded right now by our competitors that require new um, sensors in response. And the NORAD sensor system um, is due for an upgrade. We've known that for many, many years. The war in Ukraine is providing sort of a kick in the pants to put some money into that, which I think is fantastic. Um, but it's really important outside of the Ukraine context as well. And um, again, I think that's one of those other areas where, you know, making sure we can continue to sort of walk and chew gum, deal with the Ukraine situation and deter Russia while also advancing capabilities when it comes to space, um, advanced sensors, some of the sort of high-end systems is really, really important. I'm glad that this question, this issue was raised. Thank you, uh, Thomas, I'll turn it to you. 
Yeah, I, frankly, I'm, I'm not going to take up too much time. I think Rebecca answered that uh, far better than, than I could. Uh, just, just to say, I think that the concept of, of space and NORAD modernization is wor well worth keeping an eye on. I think it's really, really interesting. I think the um, sensor suite that is required in the Arctic, if we're going to go to the ideal world, it needs to stretch from space all the way down. And so in that sense, uh, the, 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 I don't know about the weaponization of space, particularly in this context, but in terms of integrating space and better understanding how we can use space and developing the technology to use space in a very awkward phys physical environment um, uh, uh, above the pole is going to be uh, uh, an area of, of real significance over the next couple of decades. So, yeah, that's all I'll say on that one. Thank you. Captain French, it's your time to shine. Show us. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's a very important question. It's not something that necessarily in my field. Uh, obviously, I'd like to prefer to obviously uh, jump into what the U.S. Navy is doing maritime wise and how Canadian Navy is supporting and where we're going. But uh, I do think it is a fascinating question. I think uh, Canada, Canadian Force will have um, a role in that in the future. It's something that we're, we've been slow to, to get to, but I think we're going to uh, see more and more interest in that in that domain. Uh, obviously, as uh, NORAD modernizes and the space-based domain becomes part of the, the all domain uh, that we're to deter and, and de uh, detect, deny, and deter, uh, it's going to be more important for us to pay attention to. Um, so uh, it, it's not a lost battle. It's something that we're going to have, have to obviously achieve. It's going to be, I, I agree that in the long term, we're just going to have to really pay attention to what are the capabilities that we're after, specifically for Arctic or even just uh, nationally and in other theaters. That, that would then enhance uh, Arctic capabilities. Um, and so we're looking at all those things and trying to make the, the right decisions based on the right capability, based on based on the right threats, based on what the threats uh, of the future might be. So I think that's, uh, that's really key. I, I would add though, that I, I think we might try to change our um, uh, polar bear logo to maybe something like with Will Ferrell uh, hitting a cowbell so that, you know, so when we're trying to draw people up here for Northern operations, I just got a more cowbell logo. I think that might actually draw some more people up here. So I'm going to use that. Thank you. Uh, we have three minutes. And so if we can like, you know, 30 second answers, I think we can get to this last question um, by the, the group. And, and Thomas, I'm going to give you the opportunity to back clean up on this one so that everybody has it. So has your opinion of the capability of Russia in the Arctic changed given their many operational problems in Ukraine? And does this change how the West needs to prepare militarily in the region? Um, so Rebecca, I'm gonna throw it to you again. Um, okay, I'll take this quickly. Um, in, in short, you know, no, the capabilities in the Arctic um, are very different, more of maritime and air um, uh, high-end sort of context. You know, in Ukraine, we've certainly seen Russia lose a lot of troops and a lot of tanks, but those are not the forces they would be fighting in the Arctic. Um, and they have very advanced high-end capabilities, um, submarine capabilities, um, you know, air sensor capabilities in the Arctic. So um, in brief, no. Thank you, Captain Fritz. Yeah, so I, I think um, there was a really interesting New York Times article, you know, down and not out. I think that that's really the key thing to look at in terms of, I think it was a great article in terms of the way it's written, in terms of what uh, we might um, think that uh, Russia's losing in, in an Arctic domain, just based on what we're seeing playing out in Ukraine. But that's, as Rebecca's pointed out, it's not necessarily the case. And we need to be very careful. I think what happens post-Ukraine to how they're positioning themselves in the Arctic, are they going to be limiting their money and their resources to not throw at that problem? Or are they going to be um, um, uh, reacting and counter counter reacting to what is going to probably be more present at their doorstep, especially the Baltic states there. So I think it'll be important to um, monitor that and to watch what they're doing, not necessarily what they're saying. Um, and uh, but I, I do think that that's uh, that uh, not I've seen previously. Thank you. Um, and Thomas, you will Fantastic. have last word. 
Marvellous. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's been such an interesting um, point to, to kind of sit back and watch a lot of people who know an awful lot about Russian military capability talking about what they've seen in Ukraine, how that differed from what was anticipated and all of, all of those questions. It's a brilliant article by Michael Kaufman and Rob Lee on War on the Rocks that came out last week that was absolutely spot on. And, and I would strongly recommend everyone go and read that. Um, to, my main point here is that, again, we need to, to think about this in terms of different arctics and different threats, uh, exactly as, as Rebecca said. Perhaps if I'm in Finland, I'm a little bit happier with what I've seen from, from the action in Ukraine because they haven't performed particularly brilliantly. But we also need to then look at, well, they've actually improved performance uh, in more recent weeks. So potentially that, that changes at the dynamic slightly. But the, the key point here, we need to think about the different forms of threats. Um, in the different regions uh, of the Arctic. And we need to be careful with what lessons we take out of um, the, at least the first uh, month of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Thank you. And uh, right on 10.30, we could not have done that better if we tried. So I really appreciate um, all of the panelists for their time and participation and, and also to the, the broader community that joins us here. Um, and I will pass it off to, to Matthew to, to continue um, with the rest of the program. Thank you, Jack. And I would like to, to thank all uh, the panelists. Great insights, a lot of food for thoughts. Um, thank you also to, to Jackie for a superb moderation of the panel. Uh, thank you, thank you all. Um, we'll continue our, our reflection um, with the second panel. So uh, sticking to the schedule online, uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. Just so if you want to brew another cup of coffee or you want to relax a bit and, and get in the breather before we start our, our uh, third and final panel of, of the conference. Um, a bit more eclectic in terms of topics, we're going to talk about shipping, natural resources, continental shelf, uh, and information. So how, for example, the Twitter sphere change or not after uh, the start of the, uh, of the invasion. Uh, so we'll take a 15 minute break. So we're going to be at 10.45. All right, glad, glad to be back. So we're going to start our, our third panel, um, focusing on economic and social consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, but, you know, talk about different different aspects, different topics, shipping, resources, on the shelf information. Um, just uh, before we start, if uh, uh, you have a question, I know some fellow panelists remained uh, from, from the previous panel. So if you're a panelist, you can share your questions in the chat over there. If you're an attendee, you have the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. You can type at any time. It's going to show here, and I'm going to share your questions with uh, panelists. If it's for all panelists, you know, just put the question. If it's for panelists in particular, maybe put the name of uh, the panelist in, in question. So uh, today we have uh, five uh, five experts with us to talk about these topics. Philippe Lassaf first, professor at Laval University. Heather Exner Perot, uh, Senior Fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute, Global Fellow at the Wilson Center. Uh, I have to say, Dr. Uh, Pauline Pick now, passed her, her PhD month and a half ago, researcher at uh, the Observatory of Politics and Security in the Arctic, who's a PhD candidate, now passed from Laval University. Uh, Aiden Spiritu is a, uh, a researcher at the Arctic University of Norway, and Gregory A. Polzer is a researcher at Lulea University of Technology in uh, Sweden. Um, so many different angles we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to start with, with Frederik, uh, uh, shipping or economic development. Uh, what are the consequences for, uh, for especially the Russian Arctic, but, you know, in general? All right. Thank you very much, Mathieu. So I'll share my screen in the first place. Oh, is it working? We can see your presentation, but not in full screen mode currently. Not in full screen. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it better? 
Nothing has changed yet. Uh, have, you, have you gone full screen? There we are. Perfect. Okay. Then. Yeah. Okay. That's fine now. Okay, so I just would like to share a few thoughts with you, uh, maybe five, 10 minutes, about the impact of the war in Ukraine on economic development in the Russian Arctic. Uh, first, as far as resources are concerned, a few observations. First, uh, there was an ongoing trend before the, the, the war uh, of uh, banking and insurance institutions that refrain from supporting oil and gas ventures in the Arctic. And this movement seems to be picking up uh, Picking strength again uh, recently, several institutions uh, announced the, their intention to, to, to ban participation in, in Arctic uh, hydrocarbon uh, extraction. There's also a ban that was announced by the uh, European Union on coal imports that would severely hit, of course, the moment's tra traffic and the coal industry in, uh, in Russia, especially major investments in the Timir Peninsula that were planned to, to begin this year uh, so as to... to uh, uh, to develop new mines with, with the Chinese and, and Indian investors. Uh, that remains to be seen to what extent they're going to proceed with these, these projects. Uh, Western companies are also key for technology to build liquefied nat natural plants. For, for, so it, the, that technology is very important for uh, gas extraction, same, similarly for uh, technology for oil development in the Pamir Peninsula with the project of Vostok Oil. So uh, it could, the, the, the embargo could severely uh, hit uh, resource development projects in, uh, in Russia. If we look at uh, a few projects, for instance, at Yamal, Total, the French oil company owned about 20% of the, um, the capital and then 10% in Arctic LNG2. And the company says it's at the beginning of withdrawal. To what extent is it going to proceed with a complete withdrawal? Nobody knows. How long would it take to completely with, with, withdraw if it was to, if it were to, to proceed? Nobody knows either. But uh, clearly, uh, now Total is going to refrain from investing further ca capital in these projects. Of course, there are Chinese uh, investments in these uh, ventures too. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to, on that point in, in, a, in a moment. Clearly, Russia is trying to promote uh, further investments from Chinese and Indian companies so as to make up for uh, the withdrawal of uh, uh, Western company. Uh, there's also There are also questions about the participation of Japanese companies. For instance, Mitsui owns 10% uh, in uh, the venture article in G2, and it's not clear to what extent uh, Mitsui really wants to pull out of this project. There are pressures from Western states, of course, especially the United States, on Japan to withdraw from these ventures, but so far, uh, Mitsui proved extremely reluctant uh, from withdrawing from uh, Article NG2. There's the Vostok oil project that I uh, mentioned quickly in, a, in a, min a few minutes ago. It's a very ambitious development plan by and where West Western or Asian companies are really needed either for the conditioning of uh, the processing of the oil or the ice class vessel construction that are needed to uh, transport the oil. Um, Chinese Indian companies are actively neg negotiating, maybe to take over, at least to take part in, in the project, of course, because cl Moscow clearly invited non-Arctic states to uh, upgrade uh, participation in natural resor resources extraction in the Arctic. However, uh, it also appeared that several Chinese companies are prudent uh, the, the possibility to upgrade their investments in Russia because they want to avoid sanctions from the European Union and the United States. To what extent would these two, uh, la the two actors really uh, inflict uh, sanctions on, on them remains to be seen too. But uh, contrary to what can often be seen, uh, be, be uh, mentioned in the, in, the, in the media, there are Chinese uh, companies that are balancing the pros and cons of furthering their investments in natural resources extraction in the, in the Russian Arctic. In May, uh, last May, construction was still going ahead at the Daimir uh, processing plant. Uh, to what extent will these sanctions really affect the development, the ongoing uh, of the 
de development of the Tymere Peninsula projects also remains to be seen. Sorry. As far as shipping is concerned, there will be likely delays in the development of extractive projects, uh, as we mentioned. So that will, of course, affect the, the development of shipping since uh, the, a large share of shipping in the, in the Russian Arctic stems from the transportation of natural resources. Uh, there are financial consequences also. For instance, they were the, the Korean uh, shipbuilder recently canceled an Arctic LNG carrier for Southern Flood because of payment default from, from the Russian company. So that might, of course, affect the development of uh, both uh, gas extraction and uh, shipping in the, in the Russian Arctic. There will be also likely a slower growth in traffic uh, because of the, uh, of, of the sanctions. However, for now, Moscow still clings to its target of reaching 80 million tons for 2024. Transit traffic remains uh, in, in, uh, sketchy in the, in the Northern Sea Route, although it's, it developed, it picked up uh, significantly in the past few years. Uh, you can see it's, uh, the traffic last year was up to 85 vessels that's much more than used to be in uh, 2015 2016 however it remains small when compared to of course panama or the Suez canal as far as the destinational traffic however uh, traffic uh, traffic is significantly higher and uh, in, in 20 last year in 2021 it reached nearly 35 million tons so on the way to reach uh, the um, 80 million tons set for 2024 that remains to be seen, but traffic significantly pick, picked up, largely fueled by uh, resources extraction. So that's why the two are uh, closely intertwined. If sanctions hit hard uh, natural resources extraction, of course, that will severely, severely affect the, the development of shipping. And if several European shipping companies uh, boycott shipping, in the NSR, of course, that will also affect the development of natural resources transportation and thus natural resources development projects in the Russian Arctic. So there are other ways that the shipping could be affected. For instance, the ongoing construction of the, the new icebreakers or the Arctica class that uh, is proceeding. Uh, the Baltic and Zvezda shipyards in Russia that are responsible for the construction of these vessels need several elements of Western technology in the present design. And of course, these, uh, th th this technology is now uh, under embargo. So to what extent it will de delay significantly the, you know, the construction of these icebreakers also remains to be assessed. European companies also made up about 18% of voyages in 2020 and 20% of transits in 2020, 55% in 2021. So if a large share of European shipping companies do boycott the uh, Northern Sea Route in the next few years, that might uh, entail a, a significant decline, decline in their participation and thus in traffic figures. So it remains a clear that there might be several significant economic wow. impacts of the, the war in the Ukraine uh, on economic developments in the Russian Arctic. As a conclusion, I would say it's still too early to conclude, since in, uh, in May last month, there was a 6% growth in traffic, uh, shipping traffic over 2021. However, there are constraints on extractive projects and shipping as I said, because they're both really intertwined. What could be these, these impacts? To what extent it will significantly affect? That remains to be assessed because it's too, the information we have is too sketchy. To what extent are sanctions to be followed by Japan and Korea? To what extent are Indian and Chinese companies uh, really uh, going to take over uh, withdrawal of the Western and uh, possibly Japanese and Korean companies? That also remains to be seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frederick, for a lot of good points. We'll come back. Uh, it's for a lot of questions <laughs> on my side. We'll, we'll come back uh, in the Q&A and the discussion uh, section for sure. I'll turn now to Heather Zerkaro. Some of the elements on natural resources were, were um, presented by, by Frederick, so maybe is there a few that comes to mind on your end that 
think, more salient. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Mathieu. Uh, nice to see everyone, even virtually here, uh, are all our old Arctic friends. Um, Frederick definitely stole some of my dinner, but <laughs> I think maybe I'll go, I'll take the next step from where he was. I'm glad I'm second, because I'll probably steal some dinner from Pauline and Gregory and Eileen, uh, but maybe think about the analysis of, of what I think it means. So, uh, you know, just to start off is, I think it was Lenin that said, there are decades where nothing happens and weeks where decades happen. And certainly the last few weeks, decades have happened. And I think, you know, I think we are in a new era of geopolitics. You know, there's the Cold War era and the post-Cold War era and the post-9-11 era. Uh, and I think this is a new era that we are going to see some rebalancing and some, some reorientation. And that has very huge implications, I think, for resource development and also and then for Arctic resource development. Uh, so on the Russian oil and gas side, and, and Frederick talked about a lot of the details, um, absolutely, it will start to be in decline. I know that Russia is making a lot of money right now because oil is high, and so they're still filling their war chest, et cetera, et cetera. But the sanctions have not been felt yet, but they will be felt. And so some of these sanctions are on future contracts so that people can fulfill existing contracts in, in a number of months. Um, but, but what we'll start to see in the next six, 12 months, three years, is that Russian oil companies are losing foreign technical expertise, uh, foreign manufacturing, the actual equipment. That's why we know Arctic LNG is at risk, you know, that the second uh, train probably, you know, if, when, if it'll be completed. So there, and, and, then the, and then the EU sanctions, that there was some Arctic oil that was going to Europe that can no longer go to Europe. And it's not that easy. You know, people think, you, I, people have a sense that it's so easy to take out oil and gas and just ship it wherever. But these were oriented towards terminals, you know, and, and different crudes can be refined in different places. It's not easy to just reorient where, where they were going and how they're being refined and how they're being used to just entirely new markets, certainly not in the short term. So, so in my opinion, Russian oil and gas industry and the Arctic oil and gas industry is going to take a huge hit. And, and in the next few years, we'll see the extent of that. Would China and India take Russia oil and gas? I, I absolutely think that they will. And I think, you know, in Europe and in North America, we can afford to be principled and, and we have the most at stake, you know, the wars in, in, in Europe against Ukraine. Um, so more willing to be principled. But anyone, but we are in an energy crisis and it's only going to get worse. And it's partly only gonna get worse because Russian oil is coming offline. We don't have enough supply to meet demand. So any country that can't afford more expensive oil or is looking for cheap oil, I think would go to Russia for it. But that doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem that Russia will be producing less oil. And so I think others will buy it, but that doesn't stop them. You know, that doesn't solve their problems of the technical expertise and, and the equipment and so on. Um, that I do have concerns, you know, we are, we are pushing Russia away and we should be, I totally agree with that. But I do think the, the downside of that is that there will be some rebalancing, you know, that Russia and China are closer. I think we all see that that's happening. Russia may also be closer to um, other countries where it can redirect its oil and it's, you know, and it's mining. Russia is not just a huge oil and gas producer. It's the second biggest miner in the world also. Um, so we will see some rebalancing uh, and and more bipolarity, I think. So that you know that is a strategic problem to be sending Russia to other people who are you know and, and getting them to be you know into other alliances. But um, but that's happening. Um, then I want to talk about kind of what does that mean for the rest of the Arctic? We need so we need to replace Russian oil and gas. I don't know that it'll come from the Arctic. There isn't an investment appetite to produce more, actually. And you could probably produce more from oil sands. You could produce more from shale before you would need to go to the Arctic. And we're still not producing more from oil sands. We're still not producing more for shale. There are other limitations um, that are preventing that. So, so I don't think we're looking for, it's not a desperate race like it was in 2008 to look for more oil sources. We, we need more oil, but the challenges are, are different. It's not a lack of, um, opportunity. It's a lack of interest in producing more. Um, so we'll see how long that plays out. But I don't see, I don't see the other Arctic countries compensating in oil and gas as much. But I think in critical minerals in the in the medium term as well, I, I do think there's there may be changes in the Arctic. 
that for one, we need, you know, according to the World Bank, we need quintuple the amount of mining to do the green transition, like we're talking about. If you want to do solar, if you want to do wind, if you want to do nuclear, you need the transmission lines, you need the magnets, you know, you know, like everything is copper and lithium, you need the batteries, graphite. Um, we need, we need for some of these things, you need 10 times more. For lithium, you need 10 times more than what we have right now. Uh, nickel, all these things. So we need way more minerals. Where is it going to come from? We don't want to get it from Russia. And also we don't want to get it from China. We don't want to, I think we're looking at how dependent we are on China. They're the world's number one miner. And when it comes to processing minerals, like they have monopolies on several important critical minerals that are part of the green transition. So I think it's, it's a big lift to get off of Russian and Chinese mining dominance, a big lift. They control a third of the world's mining right now. And if, if the Western world wants to have some of that domain, uh, domestic supply chain security, it'll have to come from our countries and it'll have to come partly from the Arctic. Whether Arctic regions are, you know, to the extent that they can do that quickly um, or that they want to do it at all is still a question mark. But if we're going to have a green transition, we need more mining. Some of it has to come from the Arctic. That can be an opportunity for the Arctic regions. There could be, you know, there's a commodities boom and they could take advantage of that. I just want to end off by talking about kind of the, the big, the big picture, our big geopolitical hats. And that is, is that, you know, we are, there was an energy crisis already. This didn't start with the Russian invasion in Ukraine. There was already a Russian, or there was already an energy crisis. We already didn't have the match of supply and demand. Europe was already feeling the crunch. We already had sky high natural gas prices in the fall. We already had sky high fertilizer prices in the fall because it comes from natural gas. And now, now we have food crisis, we have energy crisis, we're, and we're gonna have a commodity crisis and we have an inflation crisis. And we're probably gonna have a global recession as a result of all this. You, you know, This is about the economic and social consequences of this invasion. The cost of living in Arctic communities is going up dramatically. A lot of people already couldn't afford, you know, it was already an unaffordable place for a lot of people. And now that energy is going up there, it's not easy to replace, you know, in Canada, I think, you know, lots of communities are dependent on diesel. Um, there's no quick solutions to get off diesel. The, all the green solutions are also more expensive right now than diesel. Um, so there's, the, you know, this is a very serious humanitarian crisis, and it's going to be felt in the Arctic also. So I'll stop there, Matthew. Thank you, and thank you, Evan. Good point of, uh, yeah, humanitarian uh, uh, impact of, of, of all this point on diesel, I think. It's, world markets are, are tightened than ever, right? For diesel, the prices are skyrocketing. Um, thank you for, for, for the observation. Come back, especially on the strategic minerals uh, part, I think it's fascinating point. Um, next is, is Pauline Pick uh, talking about the continental shelf uh, case, and of course, I when if you read any, I think um, article talking about you know possible fallout for Canada or Western states uh, about the invasion, it's often about the continental shelf. Will it impact the, the, this file? Um, uh, so, Pauline, I'll turn to you to, to present a bit the the. the broad context of continental shelf uh, claims. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about continental shelf, like, like you said, uh, claims that were made in and out the Arctic. So it might be uh, feel a little disconnected from what we've talked about so far. But I think the issue of continental shelf is getting more and more attention, especially in the Arctic. So I thought it would be interesting to get a little perspective and learn from what is happening from outside the Arctic to eventually have some lessons from what could happen in the Arctic. Um, so this presentation is part of a research in progress. So it will mainly offer preliminary results and leads that we would like to investigate further. And it's part of a project led by Mathieu Landrio and Frédéric Lasser. So we look at how claims for extended continental shelves and recommendation emitted by the UN committee have been handled to try to have some clues about what could unfold in the Arctic when recommendation would be given by the commission. Uh, so as an introduction, uh, very quickly, just to be sure that we are all on the same page, I just wanted to come back to the basic principle of UNCLOS, so the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. 
So as you all probably know, UNCLOS was signed in Montego Bay in 1982, and it defines a set of maritime zones with different status of, a, uh, of sovereignty and sovereign rights for countries. So the baseline uh, is the starting point of all uh, zoning processes. And from this baseline and until 12 nautical miles is the territorial sea over which the country has full sovereignty. Beyond uh, this territorial sea is the EEZ, so the Economic Exclusive Zone, uh, which by default extends up to 200 nautical miles. So there, the, the coastal country enjoys exclusive fishing rights and exclusive rights to mineral resources from the seabed in the zone. But then, if the coastal country is able to demonstrate that the continental shelf extends beyond this 200 nautical mile, then it can submit a series of uh, geomorphological proofs to the UN Commission for the extended continental shelf. And then, upon recommendation of this committee, an extension of this continental shelf may, may be granted. But then, what I wanted to underline is that the status of this extended continental shelf is thus a bit different than in the economic exclusive zone, because continental shelf extension only gives rights on the exploitation of mineral resources to the claimant coastal country, but the water column remains part of the high seas. Um, another clarification that I wanted to make right now is that uh, according to unclosed provision, uh, the Commission makes recommendations on the basis of the scientific evidence that was given. But then it is up to states to act on those recommendations and either accept them or negotiate with other concerned parties. So recommendations given by the Commission do not have legal value, value by themselves. So it's very important because the Commission on the, uh, the Limits of Continental Chefs is a scientific commission where uh, scientists study scientific data to support or, or not uh, uh, coastal countries' claims. So now uh, that I have introduced uh, the basic principles of UNCLOS, I just wanted to quickly outline the context of our study. Uh, so a few years ago, we saw a great increase in discourses emphasizing a supposed race for the Arctic after Russia uh, mainly planted a flag uh, on the seabed of the North Pole. And it was as if the Arctic was up for grads and, and we did not really know who owned uh, the, the Arctic. But as, in, uh, as it turns out, this flag planting operation was actually part of a Russian expedition to collect data to submit a claim to that commission on extended con continental shelf. So uh, all as part of a legal process that Arctic countries resolved to respect in 2008 with the Ilulisat declaration. So with the war in Ukraine and the opposing uh, Arctic cooperation, we hear again discourses about a possible world war in the Arctic. And I found this, uh, this article that was published last week. And uh, the headline is obviously way too much, but it's, it's still worth noting that uh, beyond shipping, the article also mentions seabed resources and claims over the Arctic. So I think it underlines that at least in the media, the issue of extended continental shelves claim still carries a lot of misconceptions that we wanted to address with this project. And uh, it's in this context that we wanted to investigate all claims that were made to the Commission on the Limit of the Continental Shelves to see what lessons could we could draw from what would happen in the Arctic. So our objective is really to see if we can draw lessons from cases where the Commission has already received submission and made a recommendation. So we want to systematically uh, analyze the political risk associated with claims over extended continental shelf. And our objective is to consider whether the establishment of continental shelves can rise to the level of significant security threats. Just to have a little uh, overview of the data that we have. Uh, so we use the, the database that is available online on the UNCLOS website, where, which lists all claims submitted, their status, and eventual diplomatic reactions from third party countries. So as of April 2022, 92 claims have been submitted, including a partial submission. So with this bar plot, I wanted to look at the timeline of those submissions, because it's also uh, something that comes uh, a lot when we speak about the Arctic. Uh, because as you can see, there was a peak in 2009. Uh, and otherwise, submissions are fairly regular over the year. So what happened there is that the Commission has actually set the time limit for submissions, which was 10 years after the Convention uh, came into force in the country in question, which for a ma majority of country was in 1999, hence this peak in 2009. So when we speak of, about a race uh, over the Arctic, it was actually part of this legal, uh, this legal process that we can see very clearly here. Um, just to have an overview of country that submitted a, a submission, uh, I just drew this uh, this map uh, just to underline that there is nothing that is too surprising. 
and obviously we find only uh, coastal countries. Uh, we can see that uh, some countries have uh, submitted uh, more than one claim, and obviously the US has not submitted any claims, at least has not uh, ratified the convention. Uh, however, it's interesting to underline that they have reacted to some claims and interacted with the Commission on several occasions, so that's something to, to bear in mind. And just as a final overview uh, to finish describing this data, in terms of the, of the states of submissions that have been made, uh, on the left pie chart, we can see that most claims are currently under evaluation. So as of April 2022, 35 recommendations were adopted by the Commission, but uh, uh, states acted upon them only uh, nine times. And on the right hand side, we can see that most submissions uh, are single state submissions, meaning that in case of an overlap, negotiations will need to happen to definitely settle the outer limits of the continental shelf, because uh, only nine joint submissions have been submitted to the, to the Commission. So in the Arctic, three states have submitted uh, overlapping claims, uh, Russia, Canada, and Denmark. As you can see on the map, all three countries have claimed the seabed of the geographic North Pole. Uh, Russia submitted a revised claim last year, and we can see the extent of this claim uh, on the second map here. And as you can see, it increased significantly in size, and observers have noted that Russia could not have claimed more uh, in this last submission that was submitted last year. Uh, in 2019. Right? However, it has to be underlined that for that matter, Russia definitely follows the rules and acts in the respect of the international conventions that it uh, uh, unclose and in accordance also with the declaration of the Lulisat of 2008. As of now, there has not been uh, actual issues with those claims, except maybe in the, in the media. So if we look at other cases with overlapping claims, when uh, recommendations have been disclosed by the committee, then what can we learn from that? And I just wanted to uh, underline that uh, a few a few ways that the Commission can uh, can react, and it appears that the Commission can go in either uh, uh, one of the three following ways. So uh, the Commission can either uh, uh, consider the submission in its complete form, that is when there is no land or maritime dispute and no state has published uh, a not verbal regarding the, the submission. So this is the, the most simple simple case. On the other hand, uh, the Commission cannot. Um, defer the study of the submission when there is such a, a dispute, like a, a land or maritime dispute. For example, in the case of Myanmar submissions, Bangladesh uh, protested the, the submission Myanmar made, and then the commission deferred the study of the claim until an agreement was uh, found between the two parties. In the last case, the commission can decide to only study some portions of the, of the submission. So when the submissions regards the Antarctic, for example, uh, the Commission does not study this because of the special uh, status of this territory. Um, and so the Commission does not consider this portion of the claim. When the submission involves a land or maritime dispute, uh, the Commission does not consider this portion of the submission as well, uh, as in the case of the Malouin Islands or Falklands Islands disputing between uh, Argentina and the UK. And so this was claimed and the Commission decided not to not to look at this, uh, this portion of the, of the submission. If we look now at states, on the other hand, uh, so we are working on a, on a typology with four levels of, of, of risks. The first level would be that the recommendation is accepted by the requesting states and implemented as such, so low level of, of risk. Um, but then uh, another level would be that the recommendation is accepted by the requesting state, but without implementation. So the limit of the, of the outer continental shelf remains undefined. And as we saw from the data that we have as of now, this is most cases. Uh, another level is that the recommendation is contested by the state, but the con this contestation remains at the rhetoric level. Uh, for example, when Russia first received recommendation uh, on the, of the Commission after its first submission in 2001, Russia organized an international conference to discuss the Commission's conclusions. Some results were discussed, yet Russia continued playing by the rules and commissioned several expeditions to collect the supplementary data that was requested by the Commission. So there was some protest, but it was still going according to the rules. And then there is another level where the recommendation is contested with actions taken to protest the recommendation. However, as of now, we are yet to encounter such a case to illustrate this, this level that might happen in the future. So in the final world, I would just really like to insist on the fact that the commission is indeed a scientific commission composed of scientists and evaluating an array of scientific evidence. 
whenever the situation seems to be politically, uh, politically tense, then the Commission tends to really delay its recommendation to keep science away from politics as much as possible. Uh, so this is also something that we may keep in mind when considering pos potential consequences of the war in Ukraine on continental shelf planes in the Arctic and political reaction to this. And with that, that thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, certainly interesting to see the level of contestation versus uh, accepting uh, claims. Uh, interesting that that new Russian claim as well expand. Um, yeah, Rick came. Last, uh, uh, last presentation, um, Gregory Polzer and uh, Elias Kirtu presented together uh, to present a bit how the Arctic was framed after the invasion, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So differences or continuity. Um, yeah, so um, uh, so the uh, uh, Pauline's presentation. This is this is a a, a, pro a very fairly new project, and so um, we have at the, the very least very few conclusions at the moment, and more questions than answers. Um, and it is led also by uh, Mathieu, so um, uh, he's uh, multitasking on many fronts. Um, uh, so what, what we're looking at is, is essential communication about the Arctic and the Arctic Council. And it is a tag team between um, uh, Gregory Peltzer at uh, the Lulio Technica, Technica, University, or Lulio Te University of Technology and me at um, Irene Espiritu at uh, the University, um, the Arctic University of Norway. And this is just uh, our way forward. Um, and I'll be sh showing you some data, data visualization of, um, of uh, where we are in terms of measuring Twitter uh, feeds uh, on the Arctic and the Arctic Council. I uh, uh, I have eliminated other um, hashtags such as Greenland and um, I can't remember the other two. <laughs> uh, Sami and um, I think Inuit was the third. Um, just for this presentation, just to, to just for the brevity um, part of this presentation, and I'll also um, uh, sort of conclude that that section by looking at uh, what the Arctic Council has tweeted since uh since the war um in ukraine and then uh i'll hand it off to gregory after that so um much you can probably say more about this than i can because it's his team at uh uh at the uh, echo national ha that have created this uh this platform for um analyzing the tweets and so uh as you see we can we can look at things like uh tweets frequency hashtags frequency and the like, and I'll just show you what that looks like um, before and after. So this is the frequency of tweets uh, after, or before the, the uh, incursion into Ukraine. So that's from 1st of January until the 23rd of uh, February, um, 2022. And um, this is after, and as you, you um, might be a little bit confusing, as you see, there, there is a, there has been a, a decline in the number of tweets on the Arctic and and the, using um, the hashtags Arctic and Arctic Council. And this is uh, the hashtag frequency before. Um, I did look at what the apprentice was. I don't know why it was so prominent, but it, there was a, a British TV show uh, that ran in January. That was, I guess, in, in, in February that was incredibly popular. So it dominated Twitter for for that time period. It, it's uh, um, it's amazing that it even it was linked to to our, our topic of Arctic and Arctic Council. And then this is the, the after. And as you can see, Ukraine appears here much more prominently. And of course, Russia. And, and as I was um, saying uh, at a meeting with uh, Matthew and Gregory, I think this was also uh, a major concern for scientists who felt that with the war um, uh, going on in Ukraine, that there would be less, much less, uh, focus on climate change and, and climate action. And indeed, it, at least if we look at Twitter, it looks um, like that's that's the case. Uh, I'm hoping that's not true in terms of um, real world, but, um, but it, certainly on the Russian side, which is half of the Arctic, as many of us have already em emphasized, uh, uh, climate action has, I think, pretty much um, uh, been, for lack of a better term, frozen. Um, 
since the war. And looking at word clouds, um, this was before. And then um, as you see, again, the emphasis on, on things that we know in the Arctic. Um, but that uh, those kinds of uh, concerns um, uh, are still present, except now you have the addition of, of uh, Ukraine. Um, and this is, um, these are uh, hashtag core occurrences. Um, it's a bit weird. Again, we have the apprentice uh, showing up on, on, on this, um, which is really odd. Uh, Twitter um, was really burning hot with, with that hashtag. Uh, but again, climate crisis was, was on, on, on the agenda, climate change, environment, global warming. And then after the invasion, the same things um, uh, occurred, but perhaps uh, um, less frequently. Frequently, um, and Putin and Ukraine are also uh, prominent, and uh, with the addition of uh, Sweden, um, which perhaps Gregory will uh, talk about a little bit later. Um, we also see that um, everything that the Arctic Council has tweeted has basically stopped. In, in, in and around March 1st to March 3rd, uh, since their activities were frozen uh, or were, were um, suspended. And of course, this, is, this has um, uh, perhaps, uh, the reason for this is because uh, it, it's Russia that's uh, the ch chairing the Arctic Council at the moment. Um, but I'm not sure, and I think maybe Jennifer, Jennifer Spence, who I have noticed is on, on, uh, uh, in the audience, um, can answer this. I'm not sure why, um, the work of the working groups have have also been suspended. Although I, I understand that for the for the SDWG because the, your chair is um, in Russia, but uh, um, uh, and maybe this is also reflective of of uh, just what's going on on Twitter. I'm not sure what's going on in the background in terms of, of the activities going on for the um, for for the um, working groups, also for for the Arctic Council. For all I know, things are happening. In the background, but but just not um, a scene on on Twitter and Twitter feeds. But the, the reason why Twitter is important in this regard, in terms of the Arctic and the Arctic Council, I think is because it it gives us a platform for talking about what's in the Arctic. It's uh, also a brand awareness. I mean, most people I think don't know where the Arctic is still um, around the world. It's, we are a very small place and a small community. Uh, Twitter or social media also allows us um, a connection with the rest of the world. And it also communicates what's happening in the Arctic and in terms of politics and societies and, and communities and um, uh, economics as, as uh, Frederick and, and um, Heather have, have uh, asserted in terms of how important that is in the Arctic. And also uh, may, maybe most importantly for us uh, researchers is uh, to, to um, uh, advance what's going on in terms of science and research in the Arctic. And I think that's uh, probably one of the most important keys for the Arctic Council and also uh, the Arctic um, writ large. Uh, but the question is what will, it, what will happen in, if, or as this visibility of the Arctic and the Arctic Council declines and what, what will it mean for um, what we do in the Arctic and and uh, how we share that with the rest of the world. So, oh, sorry, Gregory, I'll hand it over well, to you. Yeah, I can take I can take it from here. Yeah, yeah. So then, looking at what's happening on Twitter, obviously this uh, heavy emphasis on the environment, no surprise. So then, what's the implication when you have this greater uh, emphasis on Russia, where does Russia fit into the Arctic? And then, yeah, can we go to the next slide? Uh, this idea that, you know, this classic idea from Huntington is this a clash of civilizations. So if you look at this Arctic clash of civilizations, what's going to happen in the Arctic? And I'm so glad that uh, both Heather and Pauline talked about how important geopolitics is now. Arguably, geopolitics is hasn't been this important for the past 20, 30 years. And so where now do these other Arctic countries position themselves and what's the role of the Arctic Council in the future of Arctic relationships? Uh, can we go to the next one? And so because the Arctic 
Council's premise on this idea of collaboration, particularly around environmental science, environmental research, what's going to happen? Is there going to be a future of collaboration or protectionism? Are these Western Arctic states going to collaborate a lot more by themselves and then protect the information data that they're gathering versus what's happening in Russia? Uh, that's, that remains to be seen. And it puts the Arctic Council in a very precarious position because one of its fundamental roles is to foster collaboration within the region. And if that's if the member states are not interested in that kind of collaboration, where does this place the Arctic Council? At? What's its mandate moving forward? Can it actually fulfill its obligations, its vision? Uh, and this is especially interesting now in terms of geopolitics. Two uh, Arctic states are now applying for NATO membership. Uh, you think about Sweden, they've been neutral for the past 200 years. The implications of the war are now they're actually going to join, potentially join NATO, uh, join the other Western states and Finland as well in a military uh, allegiance. What is that? What kind of implications does that have on the Arctic Council on future uh, cooperation? And then, can we hope that uh, an institution like the Arctic Council can actually help bridge some of this tension? If we actually can, if the research and collaboration continues to happen, is that something that can actually avoid future conflict, or will the future conflict uh, actually end all of that collaboration? And so are we entering this new age of global divisions or sort of returning to an age of old global divisions? Or will the work of the Arctic Council and what it's uh, intended to do actually help alleviate some of this tension? Um, and I, I just came up with this as, uh, as Frederick and, and uh, Heather were speaking. Um, I, I'll, I'll uh, confess that. And I'm, I'm wondering whether it's, it'll be a matter of economics that, that uh, will uh, avoid this idea of a clash of civilizations. Um, I, I know that, uh, that uh, China sees Europe as, as still a big marketplace. So it's, uh, it's um, walking a, a tight, a very tight, uh, uh, rope uh, between Russia, between support of Russia and and having you know, Europe as a, as a market, and so um, this is sort of the, you know, the 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 burning question for for us also as as we um, as we examine uh, what will happen with um, with uh, communicating what goes on in the Arctic through through social media such as Twitter. Thanks. Questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aileen. Thank you, Gregory, uh, for this presentation. So we'll bring everything together. Uh, I remind the attendees, if you have a question for, for one uh, panelist, uh, you can uh, type it in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. If you're a failed panelist and from another panel, you want a question for, for panelists as well, uh, you can uh, type it in the chat. Uh, just for I was going to work for the discussion. If you're a panelist, uh, if you want to jump in, maybe just unmute. I'll know that you want to jump in. You want to uh, intervene something, uh, so that you know to keep the flow of discussion going. I have a question of my own. As I heard all these presentations, a lot of questions came came to mind. If I, I start with the more resources aspect, um, I think Heather, you talked about uh, uh, sanctions on technology. For Russian firms, Federic, you talked also about that. It's a question I had thinking, are those temporary in a way that, okay, you don't maybe don't have access to technology now to continue uh, building projects, but could it go away in a fairly quick fashion once, I don't know, if the war is over, if Asian is over, that. Is that the type of, of change that could uh, arrive pretty quickly, or will it really put an enormous delay on, on production? Maybe other. I think it's an enormous delay. There's no, I mean, there's no quick way to reverse this. It was very abrupt. Companies are losing bill. They're writing off billions of dollars on our on Russian projects, and so there's. It's just that there's a very high risk now. Like you, you know, we all knew about the risks. There are already sanctions. And now, you know, like Starbucks is leaving, McDonald's is leaving, and they're not talking about 
billion dollar kind of transfers and, and contracts and that kind of thing. So for a Western publicly traded company that just wrote off billions of dollars because of the risk of going into Russia, how will Russia de-risk and make itself attractive for investment again? For sure, not as long as Putin is in power. And then God knows what's going to happen after that. You know, if you're going to have a Gorbachev, if you're going to have something that's, you know, more aggressive than Putin, no one knows. So until, like, so for sure, until we know who's replacing Putin and how stable that is, it would not be in the interest of shareholders for a company to reinvest in Russia. The, the, the severance has happened is very painful for, for many companies. And so, you know, I can't think of, a good reason to want to go back into that environment, given all the risks. And, and we're, I mean, right now there's sanctions. So you know, we still have sanctions from, from Crimea. Those, it doesn't, it's like saying, it takes a long time for a sanction to come off too. And to, you know, and Iran still has sanctions, Venezuela has sanctions. So sanctions aren't something that come off and on easily either. So I just can't see Western companies. Um, and, and these are, there isn't, you know, you're going to have Soviet era equipment, <laughs> you know, like it's not, there's no, there's nowhere else to go. You can't replace, you know, German engineering and American engineering and American know-how on oil and gas. There aren't other, you know, especially in the Arctic, you know, with, you know, Middle East doesn't know about Arctic extraction, you know, China doesn't know about Arctic extraction. These are very technical kinds of projects. So yeah, it's a, and I've said this before, I, like Russian Arctic oil and gas is in a death spiral. Frédéric, you want to want to add or uh, you can just maybe add a few words. Although uh, Heather gave it gave a clear picture of the um, uh, the reasoning of from from most most companies, uh, they, have, they have a clear conscience of the uh, amounts that they're losing because of the um, of the sanctions, and I guess most of them are really dying for uh, hoping for the days. And they can resume operations in the in the Arctic, uh, and there are also other considerations beyond mere corporate calculations, which are quite legitimate. Um, I hinted that, for instance, that the fact that Japan was quite reluctant in uh, stepping into uh, enforcing the embargo against uh, Russian gas, because they they also see in the longer in, in the longer term, if we give up on this gas, where are we going to secure our supply? And uh, so they, they don't want China to take over the fields that they began developing, and they want to secure their own uh, supply for, for, for the, the Japanese economy. So this, this is, I guess, also considerations governments might nurture uh, in, in, co in coordination with their uh, national companies. And I guess uh, that also pleads for the uh, uh, short resumption of activities when the war is over. I don't want to put you on the spot, Frédéric, but I was intrigued by the Japanese firm's position. Uh, don't want to ask for a prediction from you, but I kind of want to. Uh, do you think Japanese firms are <laughs> are likely to to pull out, or should we be a betting man? I think it's always very dangerous to to guess and predict what's going to <laughs> take place. What I can read for now is that clearly Mitsui is not really willing to pull out of the um, uh, of the Russian Arctic, uh, either from Yamal Arctic Energy 2 or from Sakhalin. They, they invested too much and the stakes are too high for the, the company and for the Japanese government, in, in their view, of course. Um, just want to come back on the continental shelf. Uh, we talk a lot about structures, right? about uh, pressure also from institutions and, and Colleen, I was wondering, what can we see in a preliminary fashion from how states perceive the commission uh, on the limits on the continental shelf? Because a lot of it is, uh, and I remember a lot of Arctic specialists talking about Russia's stance versus the continental shelf, thinking, well, the commission will come up with recommendations, we up to state to follow them. So, I mean, in my mind, the big question is, are states having a favorable perception of the commission? Do they, do they think the perception is credible? So were you able to see some, some pushback from states or, or states kind of, you know, maybe questioning uh, the legitimacy of the commission? 
Yeah, um, so I think one of the biggest push that I saw uh, as of now, but really I want to underline that is a work in progress, so I, don't, uh, I didn't study all the cases. Uh, but from what I saw, uh, the Russian case is really interesting because uh, after, so they were the first to submit a request to the, to the commission. And then, uh, so it was in 2001. And I think it was a few years later that, uh, that the commission uh, rendered its, uh, its conclusions. And then, uh, so Russia really did, was did not really agree with the with the results of the commission, but they uh, so they organized this big conference with uh, international scientists, uh, and so there were Russian speaking scientists, but also uh, scientists coming from outside of Russia to study uh, the the and to really discuss the conclusions of the of the committee and and to try and see uh, how legitimate the 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 the, the revised. Uh, the revisions, sorry, that were that were requested by the by the commission, and so I think it was really interesting to see how they still uh, played by the rules because they did not officially um, say, okay, we are not going to listen to the to the commission's recommendation, but they still organized this conference, and there were two uh, high functionaries. Is that the right English word? Yeah, uh, two uh, two high functionaries uh, that were speaking uh, so from the from Russian state, but they were speaking in their name and not in the name of Russia. But still, they were invited to the conference, and in that conference, they said that uh, they discussed the results of the of the commission. So that that was a sort of a pushback. But in the same way, um, Russia still commissioned expeditions to go and fetch data and the supplementary data that was requested by the by the commission. So it was a, a way to maybe discuss the legitimacy of the of the of the commission and the, rec the recommendations that they emitted, but still it Russia kept playing by the rule. And as of now, this is the biggest push uh, that I saw. Uh, otherwise, just states really follow what what the commission says. Could you know that conflict and cooperation? Question. I like anything that you pointed out at the end. Thing. Can we find a common culture? Can we can we detect maybe on Twitter uh, a common narrative? Because I think right now we're hearing a lot of opposition, right, between Russia and the rest of the Arctic. It's a given now. But can we or Gregory, right? Can we spot kind of maybe unifying teams or, or common narratives that, that could be advanced to, to cooperate forward or to see common priorities. The Arctic without Russia or <laughs> just- uh, No, uh, with, yeah. I mean, with- uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's it's th that's difficult. Um, although there was an article just a couple of days ago, maybe uh, I can't remember the date now, um, of the chair of the Arctic Council uh, basically being interviewed by High North News, and he's basically saying, "Let's we have to we have to keep um, the lines of communication open." Um, uh, on what fronts? Um, it's it's yet to be decided. I think for for Russia. Because I, I'm not sure um, how how lines of communication can be opened as long as Russia has tanks on the ground in Ukraine, um, and I think it impacts a lot of uh, things internationally. Even uh, the, the question of the seabed will will that question for the Commission be suspended because Russia is a, basically a rogue state who is not behaving itself internationally. I mean illegally. Um, uh, waging war with with its neighbor, so um, it's it's difficult to see what common ground there can be, except for, perhaps for climate change. Uh, I think um, many of your panelists yesterday pointed out um, the dire situation of things like permafrost and how methane is escaping as we speak uh, all throughout Russia. Um, all throughout the the, the, the Ar Russian Arctic, and it's it's in a dire situation there more than it is in Canada, where the, the there's also um, massive uh, permafrost um, uh, uh, sites, if one could call it that. Uh, and in Russia, it's um, it's impacting huge populations because they decide to build these gigantic uh, high rises. Um, on permafrost, and those buildings are falling down. So it's not just methane being being, being um, released because of of uh, thaw of permafrost, but also buildings falling down around 
people living in them. Uh, so, and it, it, Russia has, has not solved that infrastructure problem. Um, but I'll let Gregory speak and to see if there are any commonalities. I'm, I'm, I think climate change is probably one of the biggest ones. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. And I think that's one of the things that we saw at least in this very early uh, analysis of the the Twitter using the Twitter database is that you know climate environment that was always even even with the war in Russia climate and the environment still stayed as sort of the the most top mentioned the the, the biggest issue in the Arctic over across Twitter. And so I think one of the things that you could use actually Twitter to determine is how long can that sustain will that sustain. So as the war continues, as geopolitics change, as tensions uh, continue, and as maybe as new uh, allegiances grow, will the environment actually make stay as sort of the top priority for the Arctic? Because if it does, then it is this sort of indication that people who are interested in the Ar Arctic, this is a window of opportunity to not ignore what's happening, but to work around what's happening. Here, here is this commonality that researchers doesn't matter which Arctic state you're from, you still think this is a critical issue that needs to be investigated. And in a way, if that's so critical for the Arctic, then Arctic states will also recognize its importance. So that's why I say there's it's this uh, weird position that the Arctic Council is in right now. Can it continue to work on this mandate of building Arctic cooperation around environmental issues, which was its you know, initial goal? And if there is enough interest, and I mean, Twitter, not the only measure, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a good measure of how high, how high that level of interest is. If it stays that way, then absolutely. This is something that researchers should actually collaborate on. We need, there are important issues that have huge societal effects that need to be looked at we, just because, or uh, despite massive, uh, problems in other areas of the world, we, we can't ignore that. J just because there's a conflict in one area doesn't mean we can ignore all these other issues that, that, have, that have been permeating for the past few decades. You think it's, it kind of mirrors the calls we heard from people saying, well, maybe cooperation could resume on climate change for scientists to sign just that question. Yeah, I would just say, I think, it, I think it's likely um, you know, at a functional level, at a scientific level to have cooperation, and it's unlikely for it to happen in a state sanctioned, you know, Arctic Council level. So I think, I think people can be creative. And I think there will be, you know, people will maybe turn a blind eye to allow some of that scientific cooperation to continue and share data. Um, but I don't think it'll happen at the state level, um, as long as Putin's in power. <laughs> Heather, just to come back on a point, because we talk about climate change, and I heard you in, in your initial remarks talk about the importance of strategic minerals, of course, to fuel the, the green economy, right? To turn to a greener uh, economy and greener technologies. Um, at the same time, to fuel that green revolution will require intensive activities that <laughs> emit CO2 emissions, like extracting strategic minerals. but as you pointed out, the top two producers of, of minerals are China and Russia, two countries that Western countries want to go away from, I think, or be less dependent of. My question is, how do we or how do we reorient thinking that the two main sources are countries we don't want to do so much business with? But at the same time, if you think of new sources to strategic minerals, uh, those will take years. I mean, Western countries have higher standards uh, of, you know, reviews to pass a project, right? Than in Russia, where the standards are pretty minimal. Um, how do we reorient thinking that, okay, maybe in the interim, we're still gonna depend on China, but where will those minerals come from if we eliminate Russia from, from the equation? I mean, this this all takes, you know, this makes me sleepless at night thinking about how dire the circumstances are. We had, I think we had a great 30 year run, you know, since 1991, where there was globalization and things got cheaper and a billion people got out of poverty and things were cheap. And and all of that is is we are losing a lot of that because 
globalization doesn't look like such a great idea anymore. Um, and people say, how could, how could Germany be so foolish and depend on Russian gas? Well, it's because Russian gas is the cheapest and that was the cheapest energy that they could get. And so people will say, you know, how could you be so foolish and depend on Chinese minerals and processing? Well, it's because it's the cheapest. And so once we can't depend on Chinese minerals and processing, we're just going to pay more for everything. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, from a, from a pretty North American and European standpoint, we can't offshore the dirty work anymore, the resource development and the processing and things that have environmental impacts. Or if we do, we have to accept these security risks. And that can be disruptive and expensive as we're seeing right now. So, so, so the ups, you know, the downside or the downswing of all this for me is that the transition is going to take longer because everything is more expensive because we don't have all the minerals at our fingertips that we had a year ago. Uh, and in the Arctic, there still isn't social license. There isn't, there isn't, I don't think we've married the idea that we need, we need to have a, you know, we want to stop climate change and have a green transition. And that means that we have to do a tremendous amount of extraction of minerals and we need to have transmission lines and we need, to, you know, and we need to have development that affects the land and affects, you know, we can't, you know, we can't get solar, solar farms built, uh, you know, in, in the Nordic states because it affects you know, windmills, affect reindeer herding and you appreciate all that, but there's no way to have a, a quick transition if you know, the conservation and the climate change people are going to have a conflict right away. And it's, you know, it's happening now. And I know all this is also delayed because everything is just more expensive. So I hate, I'm not I'm usually a positive person, but they're like the domino effect of this invasion of Ukraine. It's just, it's just a hundred dominoes in a row have just fallen. So uh, can I just add on to that really quickly? I, I, I think, uh, I think Heather's 100% right. Uh, what's interesting is if, I guess, I'm gonna take a more European uh, perspective on this or Swedish perspective is, there, these questions are always, this, these are the questions that people are asking right now in terms of where we uh, procure batteries from, where we procure the minerals to develop batteries. So just uh, about 150 kilometers south of me, there's a new battery uh, manufacturing plant in Sheleftio, which is one of the biggest battery manufacturing plants in Europe, actually, it might be the biggest, uh, but there's questions about where we get the minerals from. And then when they produce the battery batteries, who's actually gonna purchase the batteries? So we've talked to some of like uh, bus uh, operators in Northern Sweden. Some of them aren't willing to buy batteries from China anymore. They, they made that social responsibility decision. They're not going to buy batteries from China anymore. They're only going to procure batteries. That are, I think these the latest ones are either in, from Finland or Sweden. So there are choices being made. Of course, you can't control the entire supply chain because some of these minerals are only, there's monopolies on certain minerals. But I think it's step by step. People are actually being more conscious and active in their purchasing of where they're getting, you know, the materials and the batteries to actually fuel the green transition. At the same time, uh, Sweden and Finland are, are what's in Europe called this battery belt. And so then all these issues that Heather talked about, about uh, conflicting land use, uh, reindeer herding, uh, the social sustainability, these are sort of top of mind. But I also think the pressure from the European Union to actually start producing batteries for European car manufacturers is going to be so high that a lot of these societal challenges are going to be put on the you know, northern uh, regions. And uh, there's going to be a lot of costs uh, bared in these regions that people haven't even thought about or haven't anticipated just because of pressure from the highly populated south is going to put that pressure on the low populated north and like as what's happened in, in history in northern in the nordic countries they're going to have to bear the environmental consequences to fuel what the needs are for the more populated south and i think there what's happening is there's a feeling of in, inevitability about that that there's there's got there's not going to be a choice in the matter especially looking at how geopolitics is working now there are there are few options now so this is sort of the only reality that uh, the European states can live with. So just to bounce back on this, does it mean loosening environmental requirement? Does it mean- One thing I've heard is in terms of permitting, so one idea that people have had instead of doing permitting, uh, 
sequentially, they're going to do it in parallel now. So instead of doing, say, you, if you're going to open a mine, instead of doing the concession permit first and then doing the environmental assessment, you do both at the same time. So shortening all the lead times for all these permits, that's one method that yeah, authorities have looked at to reduce development time. Anthony? I was, you know, and from a Canadian perspective, there's no way legally, you know, to really, it's very difficult to hurry things up. Uh, you still have Indigenous duty to consult and that's constitutionally protected. So that's not something you can just legislate away. So definitely, definitely industry is working with industry people in a much more constructive way. And there's willingness in a lot of Indigenous communities to enter into resource development when they benefit. So it's not an unsolvable problem, but there's nothing, there's nothing that you can just do with a bill in Parliament to say, we're going to do everything faster now. Uh, but there are certainly things on the government side that they could do faster. And, and, and I just want to point out, though, that now that we have a, want a green transition, we want batteries. Now we now we'll speed up resource development, and now we'll have mining. And that ignores the facts, you know. So I'm finding some hypocrisy that when mining was just something that we needed in our everyday lives for housing, and for transportation, and for you know for, that that we could slow it down and it's okay to make it more expensive. But now that we need it for batteries, now we're going to hurry it all up. And so I think for 20 years there's been a very antagonistic relationship between industry and regulators. And it has slowed down the process and there's been a real acceptance in the Western world to feel as though if they can't meet a standard, they shouldn't go on anyways. And now we're going to need to change that culture um, to say, how can we work together to get projects built? That these aren't something that we should be looking to stop, looking for excuses to stop them, but looking for ways to make them happen in an acceptable way. Uh I was back a bit on a point you raised right where you talked about the relation between European countries and Russia on resources. Uh, a question for Frédéric. Um, you talked about shipping, that uh, shipping coming from European companies are, are way down in, in the Russian Arctic. Are we talking about a few big firms uh, kind of not going through the Russian Arctic anymore and it accounts for that big drop or are we is it more diverse? Is it kind of smaller, smaller operators? Because I, you know, bigger ones, I think, okay, once one one or two big operator resume, then resume as usual, diverse one would be a bit trickier. I cannot have a clear picture of what uh, the European shipping companies are going to do this year. Uh, will they follow on the long-term contracts or will they abide by um, the sanctions and uh, cancel the contract or at least postpone them? Uh, I still don't know. Um, there are about a dozen up to 15 shipping European shipping companies doing business in the, in the Russian Arctic. Some to carry oil and gas, for instance, Dynagas, the Greek shipping company. Uh, there are also several heavy lift companies that are involved in the transportation of uh, big modules uh, necessary to build up the infrastructures and the um, processing plants uh, for, for oil and, and, and gas. These are short, of course, shorter term contracts, but they are still quite critical for the implementation of these projects. And if they uh, cancel the, the, the contract, then the, the Russian industry is going to be in a dire situation because there are no not many heavy lift carriers in the, in the world. So that, that's why the European shipping companies were well positioned and they won the contracts and there are no Russian shipping companies that can do the job easily to, to replace these uh, European shipping companies. But as I said, I do not have a clear picture as of now, as of today, about what the Europe, to what extent the European shipping companies are going to follow up to follow suit with the sanctions. That remains right to be uh -huh. Right on the team of uncertainty. <laughs> uh, Aileen, sorry, go ahead. I have a question in the chat after. Yeah. Yes, uh, I noticed that as well, but um, just a very, very quick question to, for Frederick as well. Um, I'm wondering what, what uh, uh, the, cause in order for you to ship in the Russian Arctic, you have to have a, um, um, uh, an, uh, what is it called? Uh, an, a Russian atomic icebreaker sort of following you around. So I'm wondering what the relationship between them and uh, uh, these industrial shippers are in context of the, the war in Ukraine. I mean, um, uh, is, is there pressure not to 
to ship in the Arctic because you still have to engage with, with the government, essentially, it's government-owned um, icebreakers. Of course, if you want to apply Arctic, Russian Arctic waters, you need to apply for a license or for a permit with the uh, Rosatom Flood and, uh, and the NSR, the Northern Sea Route Administration. And uh, if you are granted this, this license, then you have to abide by the rules. And of course, you are, most of the time, the ships are escorted by Russian atomic icebreakers. Uh, so far, the European shipping companies have respected the rules, and I see no reason for them no longer to respect them. It will be politically too dangerous anyway. Uh, the question is, to what extent are they going to respect the sanctions? Uh, if applied to uh, European shipping, or are they going to uh, keep on their long-term contracts uh, and carry on shipping? This, as I said, I don't know. I could have a, an idea by looking at the files for uh, an application for permits. That would be a way to try and begin to assess to what extent the, there will be major changes uh, for this summer. Otherwise, I haven't, I haven't seen any declarations by these shipping companies. I, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't give all these follow-up questions, but I'm wondering if you have any communication at all with the uh, and the um, Center for High North Logistics office in Murmansk, because we have been uh, told not to communicate at all with any of our, our colleagues in, in Russia. I'm wondering if you have been able to. I uh, still have communication lines with them, um, but they, um, so far they haven't told, uh, told me anything about uh, this particular point, either because they don't know it themselves or because they were told not to communicate with me. <laughs> Thank you, thanks. <laughs> There's that ambiguity there. Yeah. Uh, is it willingly or unwillingly? <laughs> uh, I have a question in the chat uh, of Andrew, and it's to all panelists. Uh, um, I think it touches on some of the, the presentations. Some commentators have suggested that science cooperation with Russian scientists could be a diplomatic win for Russia, which is something it is important to avoid. Do you agree? I think it speaks to should we engage with Russia or Russian entities thinking it could also carry a mess, a political message. Heather? Uh, yeah, this is a difficult question, obviously. Um, and some of you know I'm the managing editor of the Arctic yearbook. And our theme this year that we chose in January was actually Russia in the Arctic, the Russian Arctic. Uh, and one thing I've been very proud of is was our ability in, in the last 10 years to get Russian authors. Um, and all of us, and Frederick, you just mentioned, Eileen, of course, we all have friends and colleagues who are Russian. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem ethical to just, you know, certainly no one's telling us at Arctic Yearbook, you can't communicate with Russians anymore. We have Russians on our editorial board. So it's a real fine line of not wanting to punish, punish Russian nationals for what their government is doing, which seems unethical. You know what I mean? Which doesn't seem like the moral thing to do. While at the same time, to Andrew's point, not wanting to give a win for Russia. If you were, if you were a Ukraine academic, and you're seeing this, you know, they're under attack. Um, that if there's no pressure on, on civil society in Russia, then how, why would the government ever change? You know, if no one, if no one below the government is hurting because of this. So I definitely see both sides. On our side, we've decided to go ahead with the theme and to go ahead with Russian authors, um, but wouldn't publish anything of a political nature, you know, if it's scientific and it's analytic then that to me is fair game. I also wanna think about the long-term and, and there was a lot of thinking of this during the Cold War. You know, there's a whole field of literature on this during the Cold War and thinking about one day we will want to bring Russia back into the fold. You know, we don't want Russia to be an enemy in hundred years and 500 years from now, uh, in 10 years from now, frankly. It's expensive to have Russia as an enemy. And <laughs> I mean, Eileen, where Eileen is, is dangerous to have Russia as an enemy. And so is there some seeds you can plant at the scientific level that maintains some cooperation, allows Russians to understand the Western perspective, allows Westerners to understand the Russian perspective, and actually also having the good fruit of having climate change research and monitoring methane you know, emissions and permafrost. So, so while I totally understand why some Ukrainians, some realists would not want 
to see any any cooperation and I understand the perspective institutions that have forbidden that my own perspective and the perspective of the Arctic yearbook is that it's important to maintain um, nonpartisan non-political scientific um, cooperation and I should point out Aileen you're you're in Kyrgyz right so that you uh uh people that want to look at a map i'm uh, further from chickeness at the moment oh, i'm in Tromsø. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's oh, okay, tropical okay. very tropical Tromsø. <laughs> it's 20 <laughs> degrees here which is hot in the arctic it's just oh terrible um but we're hoping for rain and 10 degrees on the weekend um i just wanted to add to um, um heather's point and, and, and this is a real world, world situation in, in norway because norway in in its um in its wealth, has decided that it would have a fund for um, for the, for Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians impacted by the war. And you could, you, you as a scholar of, of these countries could apply to um, to the state or through the Norwegian Research Council. And it, they found out that it's mostly Russians who applied to this. And now the Ukrainians are are um, uh, clogging. I'm sorry, I'm losing my my English. Uh, in favor of Norwegian are um, contesting this because they're saying why are Russians uh, benefiting from our war right and I completely understand that but but uh, that's um, also to Heather's point I think um, we have to uh, realize that it's not the the everyday Russian who has started this war it's it's their government and also um, in terms of uh, collaborating with uh, with our Russian colleagues on in Russia um, just note that most of most of my partners in Russia, they really rely on on funding funding from our grants in order to actually have a living uh, or a sustainable kind of life in in places like uh, the Kola Peninsula or in Yakutsk. Um, and so, to to stop that funding, and I know there are some there's shirt grants that uh, that many re researchers in Russia have depended on to, to do collaborative research with uh, Canadian colleagues. And now all of that has stopped and it's the same in Norway, all of that transfer of, of um, salaries to uh, Russian colleagues have stopped. And so they're the ones who are suffering. And the thing is in the larger scheme of things, I realize that it's, it is a sort of a diplomatic um, um, pitfall, um, if you can call it that, but it's a, a spit in the ocean in terms of what actually is transferred in terms of, of funding to our Russian colleagues. And, uh, but the exchange for that is that, you know, you, you gain knowledge about, about uh, what's happening with permafrost on the ground, you, you gain um, other kinds of knowledges. I would of course stop at uh, 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 a nuclear, um, <laughs> nuclear exchange or a nuclear knowledge exchange or something like that, um, perhaps very much like we do with, with Iran. Um, I have delimitations on what kinds of um, uh, projects and research uh, research foci uh, we we engage with in, in Russia. But uh, looking at communities in in Teriberka, for example, it's not going to it's not going to make um, or break uh, the war in Ukraine. We saw the issue of nuclear safety. I think it's yesterday between Norway and Russia, where funding stopped, and then nuclear safety cooperation is in limbo or, you know, more Exactly, more yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had a question in uh, the chat uh, talking about resources, maybe more from a, well, maybe Canadian impacts on, on uh, uh, resource extraction. Um, um, it is directed more at other. Uh, if Canada had uh, built uh, the pipelines east and west from our oil sand, we will now be filling the gap in supply created in Russia because of the sanctions. Is there any appetite in Canada to look at this again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said the best time to start this would be. 10 years ago, or it would yeah. be now, I think I heard you say that. <laughs> That's what I said, Ed, the best time for a Canadian energy security strategy was 15 years ago. And the second best time for a Canadian energy security strategy is today. So, so it's not that I love oil and gas and greenhouse gas emissions. It's that I feel very pragmatic that 80% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels. And if you, if, and now we have a supply crisis, and, and literally tens of millions of people are going to have a famine because of it. And literally hundreds of millions of people are going to fall behind behind the poverty line behind it because 
All energy energy accessibility is correlated perfectly with every important human development indicator from gender equality to child mortality to literacy. So we need to have energy, affordable energy. And, and we are not having affordable, we, we are losing the affordable of affordability of energy. And now the Russian crisis and, you know, people in Alberta for maybe, you know, for cynical, if you're selfish reasons, people might say have been making the ethical oil argument for a long time. So have Norwegians that if you have to have, and you do, if you have to have oil in the interim before we build out these new transitions, you might as well have Canadian oil and Norwegian oil and not rely on, on Saudi oil or Venezuelan or Iranian and Russian oil. And people have been saying that, um, and now people are hearing it. So this is, so in Alberta, there's certainly a willingness and an ability. We have the third largest reserves of oil in the world. The biggest by far of a democracy. We're by far the biggest exporter of any democracy. So if you're just looking at it from an energy lens, from a NATO end, I think it's a slam dunk that you should try to increase Canadian supply and not give OPEC a bigger market share and not give Russia a bigger market share and not give uh, anyone else a bigger market share. Um, so what is the answer from, uh, there's also a climate crisis, you know? So what is the answer there? And I, and, and just, I do think carbon capture is the cheapest and fastest way to maintain energy affordability, to reduce dependence on Russia, but also addressing the, you know, kind of the need to replace Russian oil. Um, so I am a, a huge fan of carbon capture. They can do great things like the, the clean tech is evolving. People are like, oh, it's unproven and it's expensive. It's not more expensive than replacing tens of trillions of dollars of fossil fuel infrastructure, which is what we, you know, we've taken a century to build up fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and we don't have materials and we don't have the labor in place to replace it in 10 years and 20 years. So carbon capture is a short term, medium term solution to use more Canadian oil to reduce emissions and to still provide energy affordability. And I, I think, you know, I read an interesting article this week that if you don't have energy affordability and you don't have military security, then the climate security stuff is, is going to, you know, until you've addressed those it will be harder to address the climate security things because those are expensive and they require minerals and they require inputs. Um, and so you need to address them in order. And so I think having cheaper energy, having commodities available and not having a war to interrupt the flows of all these goods are essential, are necessary elements in having a green transition also. So yes, Canadian oil should have done it 10 years ago. And yes, let's put tens of billions of dollars into carbon capture, hundreds of billions of dollars into carbon capture in Norway and in, and in Canada. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. We're, we're out of time for, for our panel today. I would like to, to thank all of our panelists for uh, presenting their views, presenting their insights into, into this. Uh, we say the team is uh, in the era of uncertainty. We're not out of, uh, we're not out of uh, uncertainty. Uh, Oh uh, yeah, not by a mile. Uh, I'm sure we, uh, we will reconnect on some of these questions, either social media, other conferences. You have a feeling next year we'll also be filled with conferences to evaluate uh, uh, these, uh, these questions and, and provide answers. Uh, I would like also to thank all of our panelists. Uh, it's the conclusion of uh, two days of, of uh, uh, panels and conferences. So I'd like to thank everybody that participate, I'd like to thank everybody that attend also provide questions and engage with our, uh, our speakers. Uh, that was really uh, an interesting exchange and discussion. Um, and I hope it's going to continue on all of our platforms, certainly going to continue at OPSA, at, at NATS, and, and at, uh, at SIPS at University of uh, Ottawa. Until then, uh, have a good have a good day, and, and uh, we'll uh, probably uh, exchange on these questions again on another platform.